Welcome to the regular meeting of the Arlington School Committee on Thursday, December 12th. Uh, we're going to open the meeting with some new artwork from our, our bracket school. Uh, I'm going to start with Board A. It will go in order. You, this is Grade 1, Using Line Constructively, Tree Line Drawings. For the first lesson of the year, first graders revisited the element of line and discussed how lines could be found everywhere in our world and that artists can use different kinds of lines to express their ideas more fully. Students examined and discussed several examples of line drawings by various artists explaining how each artist used line. Next, students were shown several paintings of trees done by different artists and explored how each tree was represented differently <coughs> using various and often unexpected types of lines Students were led to notice how using a particular type of line changes the way we expect a tree to look. Finally, students were instructed to create a line drawing of their own choice. That said, everything in the picture had to be constructed from a variety of appropriate lines, and the subject had to include at least one tree. They were encouraged to think about how lines can be used to represent many parts of a tree and different species of trees. Students were given artworks created by Asian artists which depicted different species of trees during different seasons to help them think about the many ways line can be used. Over to board B, which is grade four, pinch pots revisited. Students in grade four were shown an example of a ceramic pinch pot, pinch pot vessels created by a method of clay construction known as hand building, which differs from wheel throwing construction. Pinch pot pots are a fundamental method of construction created by using the thumbs and fingers simultaneously to squeeze and press the sides of the vessels into uniformity. Artist examples all depicted a variety of techniques which were used to create interest and more complex designs. Techniques include relief building, scoring, textural impressions, and altered form that differs from the standard circular form of a traditional pinch pot. Students were then guided through the pinch pot construction process together and they then were later encouraged to include some of the additional techniques discussed in the artist exemplars. Once the pots were fired, the pieces were glazed with color and fired a second time. Moving over to board C over here, tiny treasure boxes. Third graders discussed the use and decoration of container design. They discussed how this wooden box created by a Japanese artist had the special purpose of storing incense noting the planning and execution of design upon a three-dimensional cube and as possible function and purpose allowed students to realize that everyday objects can be made beautiful by artistic skills. Students were given a template of a box which they were instructed to decorate using pencils and or markers giving special attention to how one side of the box could impact one another side as well as the top and bottom in a wraparound design. Attention was brought to the fact that there are several ways to accomplish a wraparound design but a specific theme had to be chosen to successfully unify all the sides of the box. Over to D, we have grade two, paper pendants. Why do people wear jewelry? Students in grade two learned that people, wear people, that people everywhere had decorated, have decorated themselves with jewelry since ancient times, often for many different reasons. Students examined and discussed several different artisan pendants, some of which incorporated neckline struc necklace structure as well. The examples ranged in time and period materials, and students were asked to look for clues to help them determine how each pendant was created. They enjoyed seeing how different cultures have varying styles and how artists use the same materials differently and how styles have changed over time. Despite the differences, however, some jewelry making techniques have remained similar over the centuries. Students were instructed to design and create their own pendant from paper and aluminum foil. They are encouraged to include additional decorations with markers and pencils. And finally, all the way in the back, board E, our observational drawing still life grade five. Each school year starts with drawing a still life arrangement for students in grade two through five. In past years, each grade approached the still life differently, using different skills or fresh approaches to their revisited subject. But after collecting student responses for their hopes and dreams of art class this year, every class contained a large number of responses stating hopes for learning how to draw better. I decided to address this by included, including a guiding discovery of eight different drawing materials ranging from pencils, pens, charcoals, and past pastels. Students were led through a series of explorative techniques that can be done with each material to create more interest in drawing. 
These techniques include hatching, blending, stripe, stippling, and scrofito. The level of interest among students grew considerably. <coughs> Once the exploration was over, students in grade three through five were, get, were then directed to draw the still life. But the choice of drawing in their sketchbooks of choice, but with the choice of drawing in their sketchbooks or choice of drawing paper, <coughs> and were allowed to choose which of the eight drawing materials they would prefer. Many students chose to mix materials, opting to draw some objects in ink and others in oil pastel, for example. All students were, were required to include at least one of the drawing techniques they were taught in their guided discovery session. I was very pleased with this level of renewed interest for, for observational drawing, as evidenced by the many comments from students. Those are, those are actually examples from grades three, four, and five. All right. Congratulations to all the bracket students on their wonderful art. Can I recognize David Ondito? Sure, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes, of course. And I would like to recognize David Ardito, our director of K-12 Visual Arts, and uh, applaud him on the direction that he's taking our uh, art department. Great. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment this evening? All right, so we'll move right ahead with our overview of the ELA department. Dr. Bodie, do you want to yes, I'd like to introduce, well, Over. I'll introduce uh, uh, Deb Perry, who's the director of ELA K-12, and she's going to bring up um, the literacy coaches from the elementary. What? Oh, and Justin's coming too. Justin Barraza, who is a um, high school teacher. So we need another, we need another, no, no actually, <laughs> oh, Shannon. Thanks, Shannon. We could use that. We could use that. All right. Um, well, hi, everybody. Thank you. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about the, the goals at the elementary and at the high school. Um, Excuse me one second, though. Could we introduce Maria and, and Allie? We'll do this. Um, we're going to talk about um, the goals at the elementary mm -hmm. and at the high school. Um, and I know we only have 15 minutes, and the big question is, <laughs> who's got the hook, what happens <laughs> if, we, if we go beyond. So um, you'll have to let us know. So we're going to start. Um, Allie's going to talk um, about first, first grade and first grade, I think, and third grade. Um, Maria's going to talk about, and then later Justin and I will talk about the high school. Can we have everyone just introduce yourself as you start? Hi. I'm Allie Megahayes. I'm a, one of the literacy coaches, and I work mostly with first and second grade. So I'm going to talk to you tonight about our work in assessment and intervention in grades K to 2. Over the past two years, the literacy team has played really close attention to the issue of early literacy screening and intervening. We sat in on sessions with Melissa Orkin, who's a consultant with our district. We've attended ECHO, EDCO workshops with other researchers in this area. We've compared notes with other EDCO districts and what they're doing, and we are learning about the new <coughs> dyslexia legislation. We came away with the understanding that there were specific things we could do to improve our assessment system. We need to ensure that we're screening in the right areas, intervening in a targeted way, and providing strong tier one instruction to ensure that students are getting the foundation they need to be proficient readers. We understood that we needed to pay special attention to the skills the research has shown to be strong predictors of future reading success, especially rapid naming, the ability to quickly retrieve known symbols, and timed assessments with reliable and valid test scores, especially in the following two areas, which have been found to be strong predictors for future reading success, phoneme segmentation and nonsense word reading. We reviewed our curriculum and assessments in the areas of phonemic awareness, phonics and fluency to ensure that we're addressing these areas. Through the review process, we determined that grade one was the place to start this year. We've added additional universal screeners. We selected the Dibbles because it's a standardized, research-based, reliable, and valid assessment. We're working with classroom teachers, reading specialists, and principals to use the information learned from assessments to implement targeted interventions. We, next year, we're going to roll this um, backwards to kindergarten and forward to grade two, and we're laying the groundwork for that this year. I also want to describe a little bit of the work that we're doing with first grade teachers this year because they're the ones who are most impacted by these changes. Our focus this year is to help first grade teachers understand how to administer the assessment, interpret the data, and how to support students with small group instruction based on their needs. 
Teachers were trained in the new assessment this past May. They were given a refresher in September at their first day back, and coaches and reading teachers were available to support teachers during the assessment period this fall. In October, the first grade teachers learned some small group lessons and routines that can support phonemic awareness and phonics instruction. We looked at color-coded data to form small groups based on which students would benefit from more direct instruction with segmenting and blending skills. They were also encouraged to progress monitor to follow select groups of students who might need more support. After the professional development, I've been joining data team meetings and modeling small group lessons in classrooms. A lab site model has been really successful where teachers all come together in one room to observe me doing a small group lesson and then they go off to try that lesson right then and there with coaching support. Thank you. Hi, I'm Maria Motto. I work with upper elementary and I'm going to talk about the district literacy goals for both, gra for both grades three and five. So our goal in grade three is to introduce um, the new Lucy Calkins units of study. Um, this year we're introducing the third and final unit, um, Reader's Workshop unit for grade three, and that is a nonfiction unit. It's called Reading to Learn. Um, this unit focuses on the foundational skills uh, third graders need to learn how to read and write about nonfiction texts. Um, the workshop model is newer to grade three, um, it's, we're in our second year of implementing two units. There, one of them is called Building a Reading Life. That's the introductory unit to Reader's Workshop in third grade. Another one that we did last year, and it was the first year we did it, was called Character Studies. It's a book club unit where children meet in book clubs to discuss and learn about their books together. Um, the new unit, um, because the teachers are newer to this, as coaches, we're working on really getting them to understand the components of the Reader's Workshop. So we're modeling mini lessons for them, we're modeling how to confer and meet individually with students, um, and we're also modeling small group work so they can differentiate their instruction within that independent reading time. When we've <coughs> done that is through lab sites like um, Ali was talking about, where teachers will come into a classroom, observe a lesson being te taught, coming with the teacher to see how small groups and conferring <coughs> is run, and then being able to debrief about it. Um, for grade five, we have um, a new unit that was introduced this year. It's called Interpretation Book Club. It's the second reading workshop unit for grade five. Um, in this unit, students are able to interpret the meaning of text through uncovering themes, the deeper meaning of text. Um, they also learn to understand the use of author's craft and also understand characters' motivations. Um, next year, fifth grade will have their third and final Lucy Calkins unit. Um, it's called Tackling, Tackling Text Complexity. Two schools are actually implementing that this year. It's their second year piloting this particular unit. Um, this unit is a nonfiction unit. It's designed for students to grapple with very difficult texts understand also how to summarize key points of nonfiction, and also to analyze author's craft in informational writing. Um, the high school goal for this year was narration. It had to do with narration, and it was a logical extension of two previous goals, which had to do with discourse um, and something we called ownership. Um, and I think those, those terms um, may seem a little vague to you, so I thought I'd talk for a minute about the connection um, among those and also what narration means in terms of the work that we do with high school students and also with middle school students. Um, in the simplest form, narration is telling a story. Um, when you're thinking about writing a story, one of the important things that has to happen is that as the writer, you have to understand what you're writing about and be able to own it. And the, what we had noticed in terms of both middle school and high school students over the past three or four years was the um, difficulty students were having figuring out how to put themselves into a story. The previous work, for most of the work that we have done over the past many years in terms of writing has to do with claims and evidence. That's what the Common Core has asked us to do and that's what we've done pretty naturally. It's a very um, important part of writing instruction. You have to have an idea that you want to prove and then you have to have evidence to prove that. 
And sometimes that process doesn't allow the student or the student's ideas, or at least students don't necessarily feel that it allows them to come into it. So we've worked to try to figure out how to help students put themselves into the things that they're writing. Um, at the middle school, three or four years ago, this began with um, a unit on speaking. And the middle school, particularly the eighth grade teachers, were interested in helping kids stand on their own, both literally in front of a group, but also stand on their own in terms of having an idea and supporting it and explaining it. And this was um, as much about writing as it was about developing um, a sense of confidence in the middle school students, which was something that we were a little worried wasn't, being, wasn't as evident as we wanted. The way it showed up um, in the high school um, was particularly in the junior and senior year when we were working with kids around um, writing the college essay. And the amount of support that students needed, um, the amount of time that they, that they wanted to spend, both with teachers individually after school and in classes, was extraordinary. And it, it derived from a lack of confidence in terms of being able to tell a story. That's what, <coughs> that's what the college essay is. It's telling a story. And usually, it needs to be a really small story that's well developed. And um, we understood as this was, as over the, over the period of three or four years, as we were getting more frustrated that we, we didn't have time to do this work, that we probably needed to think about narration in a more comprehensive way. So we're trying to, we're not trying to, we are actually integrating nar the narrative form more into the writing that we do at all levels um, to give kids practice at, in this <coughs> exercise. Uh, and before I turn over to Justin, just one other thing, the narrative form um, the, it's commonly thought that if you, the person who tells the story owns the story. And you, you know that if you've ever watched two children um, be involved in, let's say, the breaking of a lamp, and they run to be the first person to explain what happened. And they know instinctively that, that if they get to tell the story first, they're gonna turn, it's going to turn out better for them. Um, and so <coughs> telling a story has a point of ownership to it, has a point of power to it. Um, and that's an important thing for kids to understand. But as readers, it's also an important thing for kids to understand. So when you're looking at something um, that's being written, and this happens, in, this happens obviously in nonfiction, but it happens in fiction all the time, where the narrator tells the story, and certain things are left out, or certain voices are left out. And we're working <coughs> very hard to help students understand that there are other things going on in any story. It doesn't matter if it's a written story or something that you're watching. There are other interactions occurring and other voices that may or may not be heard um, that are important to know about. So that whole, that whole discussion of how storytelling actually is about power is something that um, we've been integrating extensively into the work that we've been doing at all levels. And Justin's going to talk a little bit about how it feels in the classroom. Sure. Uh, hi, I'm Justin Barasa. I teach 10th and 12th grade uh, English this year. Um, and to kind of you know, expand on uh, what Deb was saying a little bit, um, we're, we're, we're really fortunate, I think, that we're able to focus on narration and it's, it's popping up on things, whether or not super successfully, like MCAS, um, because the sort of things in the past that might feel like a fun assignment um, in terms of the, hey, let's think about like, you know, write a letter from this person's perspective. We, we're really comfortable um, codifying now and we can, we, we're, we're feeling more confident building rubrics um, and, and really asking, you know, what we're asking the students to do is demonstrate their literacy, their, their digital literacy, right, in a world where um, so many people are racing to either get the story first or get the story right, whether it's from journalism or I saw this and I have a Twitter account. Um, we're really teaching the students not only how to read the texts, but to, to read the world around them as well as part of the four things that we're always constantly focusing on, reading, writing, listening, and speaking as well. Um, so we're looking at things like voice, like Deb mentioned. Um, one assignment um, you know, actually features following a separate piece and noting how the power changes and turning that into a visual which is not necessarily something that might, you know, you might think about in an English class, right? And people are coming in with graphs. 
about how the power changes over time, citing evidence, well, here this, you know, Gene said this, and the, the passive voice was used here, which do we know, you know, is, is he remembering correctly 15 years later um, after he's suffered through World War II and all of its horrors? So that's one opportunity. Um, and we also are very fortunate because we are in an era now where we have classic literature, and this foundational literature like the Odyssey, for example. And I know it's really easy to think about the Odyssey. It's like, oh, come on, really? Like, we're still doing the Odyssey? But, you know, we, we have Emily Wilson's female translation of the Odyssey. We have Circe. We have the Penelopead. We have Barbara King Solver's The Bean Trees, all of which are an Odyssey, but they're coming from very different angles, and we're seeing different sorts of characters being represented. And so we can compare those journeys. We can compare the tropes and the archetypes that pop up and, and really access this, um, this social capital that does come from a very old text, but allows and encourages our students to recognize when we move into the, the world, this sort of stuff is coming up. And how, as Deb mentioned, how do we own this? How can we own our own storytelling? Um, you know, it would, be, it would be great if we could have the students remembering <laughs> the tiny little details and, and you know, what you know, a dangling participle is, but we really want them to be able to feel like they can advocate for themselves, which involves eventually, you know, that personal statement or college essay in a very short, surgical, brief but brilliant um, piece of writing about themselves, or are they able to own, you know, what's happening on the street? Are they witnessing something that they need to be speaking up about? Are they able to record the things that you know, are kind of happening in the world around them without politicizing it or anything like that. We need to be able to control everything that we can and understand that we're gonna write differently when we write a lab report than we write a formal piece of writing than we write a letter from Gene to Finney or a letter from McMurphy's point of view. I don't know who would wanna read that in particular. Um, but you know, we're, we're really, um, we're feeling good about the, the fact that we can push these sort of fun things that kind of added on to those formal writing pieces in the last at least 11 years that I've been here. Um, and we can really start bringing them to the forefront because there's value in talking about, you know, who has the power in this story and why? What's not being said? Is there some hidden curriculum? Is, is, is Gene purposely forgetting um, certain things? You know, it, is, is it even Gene's story? Um, we're right in the middle of a separate piece right now, which is why I'm <laughs> falling back onto uh, that particular story. But you'll see it at all levels, right? Whether it's um, those foundational texts like the Odyssey or even, you know, Greek tragedy with the freshmen, um, you know, things with, with Macbeth. We have, we have a, a project that we do with the 10th graders where we ask the, you know, what, what's, what's the guy that's asking Lady Macbeth out to prom? What's he thinking? You know, like, let's get a look at his diary. Scary thought, again, um, sort of a high stake social event. Um, but we, we're, we're kind of opening up because when we have these conversations with the students, you know, like, what's the difference between what you say and if Gene had a Twitter feed, right? He would be saying something very different than what he's actually talking about in the book. And it's, you know, um, we can kind of play around in a very safe way with the uncomfortable sort of, you know, am I, am I putting on a hat? Am I putting on a, a face publicly um, to represent something and kind of get at the deeper common experience that <coughs> everyone kind of goes through of, you know, do I really want to send this tweet? Maybe not, but I'm going to anyways, right? And, and you know, well, well, yeah, I guess that's one of the goals. We hope that they at least think about it before they send the tweet or whatever other social media um, like that. So it, it's been a lot of, um, it's been very rewarding. The, the students, they can describe it right away, um, and it's, it's really been very rewarding to turn it into something, you know, not necessarily four points, but where we can use the language that we use to talk about formal writing and, and language and grammar, we can use that language about language to say, oh, this is why that's effective. This is why I'm upset that, you know, my friend's leaving me on red. This is why I'm upset that all of this stuff, you know, he didn't respond. What's, what's going on? So that's the sort of thing that we're able to talk about like we talk about a piece of literature. And the, the students are, are really handling it very well. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Uh, questions from you guys? All right. Questions from the committee? Morgan. Um, so 
I thought that this was great to hear. Um, I happen to have a first grader. Um, and so I guess my question is, you know, the, the additional assessment and testing that, that you guys are either doing, either it's a replacement of something that was done before or it's something new. It's obviously really important. We're gonna, it's gonna be one of the key actions we're gonna approve later tonight as part of the superintendent's um, student achievement goal. I'm curious though, so it's, I've had my, my report card for my first grader and I've had my conference already and I haven't heard anything about like my kid, right? And so presumably he was evaluated in kindergarten and he was evaluated again in November. And I'm just curious like what the plan is for communicating about this to families because I guess I, I mean, I. I I, I suspect the answer is, well, if you haven't heard anything, he's doing fine, right? Which is like kind of great, right? But then also kind of like would be sort of helpful if, um, if we had more of a sense of that. So I was just curious if that's something you guys have talked about or what, the, what you're thinking ab about that. Um, I think that's a great question, and um, I think you're right in thinking that if the teacher hasn't mentioned it to you, then that means it's not a concern at that moment for your child, but I think parents should be informed about the assessments and what's happening in the classroom, so maybe by building base, we could try to think of a way to better inform the parents about the assessments that are happening and what those assessments mean. Absolutely. However, I do want to temper it to say that that's not the, the reason for the assessments is it to inform instruction in order to provide that overall picture of how your a profile, a learning profile of your students. So I don't want us to get hyper focused on how is my kid doing on this particular assessment and whether or not they're achieving more than their classmates. So we just have to make sure that we're balancing it by providing the information and how it is integrated into the instructional plan for servicing your student. Because if we start talking about assessments, needless to say, it's going to be, okay, we've give, given these assessments and I wanna make sure that my child is performing at a certain level. And really the overall picture is like providing foundation for their learning on how to acquire the skills that they need in order to comprehend text and to decode text. So I just want to say that I'm um, excited that you both sort of started with a goal that you want to achieve, you know, what you want to see in third grade, what you want to see at, at the end of junior year, beginning of senior year, and then worked backwards and said, you know, what, what do we need to do in those earlier years? And, I, and um, I think that's sort of the kind of thinking that we like to see and very heartening, um, and I, 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 I'm excited to hear that. Yeah. Go ahead. I wish I had a teacher like you in high school. I would have, no, seriously, I, I enjoyed the literature. I did not like the writing. And by mixing those two together and, and bring, making it real, I think that's really exciting. And I appreciate that. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, I have a, a question. So uh, also on the, on the Dibbles assessment, um, you know, we, did, we have gotten some feedback over the years that, including for myself, whose, whose kids were sort of missed because they were, doing okay on the other assessment, but at some point somebody realized that they can't decode nonsense words um, because it just wasn't caught before. So do we have a sense yet, are we catching more kids who need intervention? Is it, is it, um, is it a different set of kids? How is it different from how we were getting to your, you know, RTI to, to, as a result of these interventions? Yeah, so it is giving us a lot more information about um, a student's ability to segment and blend sounds. So even though your child might be a high reader, if, if they are scoring low on these types of assessments, it's giving us more information about how we could better support them to better understand what they're hearing in a word and how to build in those phonics and phonemic awareness skills for that child. Yeah, so it's giving us a lot more information about uh, how they, what their whole profile is as a reader, mm -hmm. not just what their reading level is or what they're understanding about the story, but how they're attacking words that they've never seen before. Yeah. Um, but are we going to need more intervention support, or, or are we okay with sort of what the, the well, model Well, what our we focus have? is this year is to really supporting classroom teachers okay. so that they can feel confident enough mm -hmm. to support those students that are in their classroom. Great. So that's what our big goal is for this year. Great. Yes, Dr. Othenby. My comments actually kind of more on the student achievement goal that was referenced earlier, but I'll bring it up now because it is involving the literacy. 
Um, the goal talks about the different assessments that you're talking about. I was hoping that as that takes place, that we could have some looping back to tell us afterwards how many students were identified, how, you know, whether they uh, improved because of the intervention. You know, what did, you didn't just identify people, <laughs> did it actually achieve the goal that you're really trying to do, which is improve literacy? So. I'm not sure of your question. <laughs> it, it's more of a comment um, that we're being told for example, that all grades, the goal is all grade two students will be given a time foundations nonsense word reading assessment in September, blah, blah, blah. Literacy coaches will work with classroom teachers to support targeted differentiated instructions based on assessment results. So my comment is it would be nice to know, do the students then improve? You know, is is it making a difference, right? It, it's that's really what we're looking for. And so I was currently, yeah, yeah. Currently, they're progress monitoring, and then we have another round of assessments in January, and then in the spring. So I right. think that data is coming. Right, and and so my point is, it'd be nice to come for us to hear Next that year. result yeah. too. But may I answer a little bit? What we're looking to do is through all of these different actions and changes so that we have better uh, window into what skill a student needs support in is that at the end of third grade there are going to be more and more of our students if not all of our students are at benchmark so the that is really really the goal but it's in and, and what we'll see and which, which will be interesting to follow the data is that some kids are gonna it's gonna be a different kind of trajectory for different students in part because what is happening now is there's a little bit more uh, granulation, uh, more maybe more of focus on some of these skills that uh, students need to become the readers that they, they, we want them to become. So um, I think this is a multi-year goal. This isn't something that's going to automatically shift everything, but it's because teachers have to learn more too in terms of the kind of strategies to support students, as well as our, you know, at the, at the tier one, at the classroom level. Can, can I? Sure, go ahead. Um, so my layman's take on it is that you're kind of going from having one ladder for all the kids to climb up to for the next level to saying, okay, well, we have this ladder over here that's maybe shorter and easier and another ladder over here for different kids and stuff. And sure. I mean, different mm -hmm. kind of different support. And, my point, and I understand that what you're trying to do is see if everyone gets up to the floor, but I'm saying, can't we find out in the meantime, are they advancing on their ladders? You know, are, are they actually climbing or are they just right. like, they're just standing at the bottom of another ladder? Yeah, right. Well, I, I think one of the things that's going to be interesting with this Dibbles testing that we're doing um, at the end of the year is just to see really uh, what the progress has been over the year and how many of our first graders are at um, a benchmark for first grade. Now we have no comparative data. Right. Over time, we will, and and in these lab models that are being created, more teachers are going to learn strategies to help students because it, it, I, I know math a lot better, uh, but I do know that at, the, at this age, almost they have a math fingerprint if you do the right assessments to see what different kinds of uh, skills that are essential. For, to learn the next thing, but sometimes if you don't have the, the the granulation of an assessment, you don't know what those are, and so you're not there supporting the students learning that. Mm -hmm. And we've come to learn. I'm coming to learn. They probably knew it a lot before I did. How important <coughs> skills are to being a very expert reader later, or maybe expert's not the right word. Proficient reader later. Okay, thank you. Yes, what, Mr. Can, can I? Oh. Can I add something? Sure, go ahead. I, I'm just saying, like, also, you know. I think that the way that we want to look at it is, a, is it, this is a trajectory yep. as it goes along. So e even after first grade, if you, the, the, the point of providing or getting, gaining more information is to even if the student is not where we want them to be after the first grade, that's the information that's going to be passed along to the second grade. 
and then the second grade teacher so that student, we can see how that student is evolving in their progress. So we wanted to make sure that we're getting the type of information and connecting it to the activities mm -hmm. that can follow up to support that. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a trajectory. So I don't want us to, again, I want to kind of keep us from saying like, here's where we're trying to get to. And if we're not there, that doesn't mean it's not working. Yeah. I want to get us away from thinking like that and thinking that this is a this is something that's going to maybe pan out over, to, depending on the student, mm -hmm. this might be, takes more time with different students, but at the end, we will have students where we want them to be. Right, well, I mean, at third grade, you know, they're all, that's, you want them all up here, right? At exactly, and, and exactly. That's, I'm saying it, it'd be nice to hear what's happening before we hit third grade. Yes, yeah. exactly. Right, and that's why they were here to, to tell you that, and these are the things that they're doing in order to work towards that. Mm -hmm. Mr. Shibin? Okay, so the typical question <coughs> for a governing board that has budget policy levers, uh, what do you need from us? What, what do you want us to be thinking about going forward? Well, I speak to the mic. I think, um, <laughs> this, this is sort of the, you're, you're sitting uh, with Santa Claus and he's asking you what you want, okay? No, we're not Santa Claus. That's a definite <laughs> maybe, though. And, and, and no Red Rider beating Understand that. Because you'll shoot your eye out. <laughs> We've had amazing success with four coaches, and we thank you for giving us um, the additional coaches last year. It was really, really helpful. I think um, having people who can work with teachers to bring the capacity of teachers up is, is probably uh, the most beneficial um, thing you can do for us. So we... Um, uh, in the budget this year, we're at the elementary, we're asking a little, for a little bit of money for um, reading teachers to sort of even that out among the seven schools. Um, and probably if that gets funded, another coach won't be. But mm -hmm. in the future, I think having coaches to work with teachers, I, 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 I can't emphasize enough how important it is to have um, people um, accessible, warm, knowledgeable human beings to work with other human beings mm -hmm. to, to explain, be next to, um, to, to help out in, in all those ways. It's just, it's, it's invaluable actually. So that's where, that's where I feel money would be well spent, um, particularly the elementary. And, and in the sec at the secondary level, um, particularly in English, the fewer students teachers have, the more attention they can pay to the students, the more time they can spend on correcting the papers, which is a killing mm -hmm. <laughs> enterprise, I have to tell you, as much, fun, as, much as we love to read. Um, it's really, um, it it's, it's, takes a lot, a lot of time. So uh, keeping class sizes at a reasonable level mm -hmm. is just is uh, the most helpful thing. Um, and giving, I mean, I will also say, we, um, we carve out time, particularly the secondary, um, to talk together in grade groups, in course groups, um, taking a day and you know, getting a sub, working together to hone curriculum. And so that, that professional development time is, has proved um, to help us make gains and to do thinking that we wouldn't ordinarily be able to do if we were just doing it by ourselves. So that it, I guess in both cases I'm talking about professionals working with professionals to, to move, um, to move our thinking ahead. That makes sense, because first of all, there's the Tom Brady rule. Oh, I don't know that. If Tom Brady <laughs> has coaches, then every teacher deserves a coach too. Okay. And it's the same thing, no matter how, you know, he, greatest of all time, but he's got coaching. Yeah. So every teacher deserves a coach because it's, it's a key to reflective practice. And, and, I, and I feel your pain for the English teachers at the high school because... I don't mean to make it sound terrible, but it's kind of awful. No, 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 hold on. <laughs> hold on, let me get this out. Uh, I was a math teacher. I was a high school math teacher, and you go sit in the faculty room, and uh, the English teachers looked at you with disdain because of what you were grading versus what they were grading, <laughs> even when you were running through proofs. But, yeah, I understand the workload. If you're really doing this well... Kids are doing a lot of writing. If they're doing a lot of writing, the teachers are doing a lot of reading, and we don't want it to get into a cycle where teachers are assigning less reading and being less interactive in that because the workload is too high. Exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. 
and that's and that's it. It's a, it's a, it's a real um, fine line mm -hmm. before people begin to sort of say, why am I doing this work? So I mean, we have to I, we work very hard to make sure that we're keeping things as balanced as, as possible. Yeah, when you have with you the stack, you're number 26, and you just yeah. Yeah, anything yeah. after 20 is a killer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, anyway, thank you for asking. <laughs> thank you. Thanks. Sure. And Dr. McNeil, you had one more thing. And also, can you speak to the impact that the schedule has had on your ability to work with teachers? Because that is something that <laughs> the, the school committee uh, approved in our budget last year. Yeah. Sure. Um, so the new schedule has really afforded us a lot of contact with teachers that maybe we wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, we're in buildings going to data team meetings um, very often, working with those teachers, looking at, looking at student work, um, being able to then go into classrooms and then use that data to inform instruction and help those teachers look at the data to be able to say, okay, I have these students in front of me, I need to get to know these students, get to know where they are in their work, and then with a coach's assistance, go in and actually use that data to then inform how they're going to teach, how are they going to differentiate, how are they going to meet with groups, how are they going to help <laughs> students with their writing. So I feel like it's been a really valuable experience, and in some schools maybe where we weren't there as often, we're able to be in those schools because of that, because that's carved out time whereas we might not have had that carved out time before. Um, it's been a great experience. Great. Yeah, oh, it's, just ex it's extremely valuable to be able to sit with all the teachers at one time, not just one or two of them, mm -hmm. to actually be able to sit with them and even meet some of them because we're in all seven schools. Sometimes it's hard to even just know who they are. So just to have that time to sit and talk and to see what are their needs, we always ask them first, how, what would you like for, for us to bring to this meeting? How is this most beneficial for you as a team? And that's been really helping us to just get our foot in the door sometimes. Great. All right. Thank you all very much for Thank coming you. tonight. <clears throat> Great job, everyone. Oh, Deb, is that your pen, maybe? Okay. Next up, we have the Arlington High School and Middle Schools FY21 budget needs requests presentation. Good evening. Hello. I am taking up the least, I want to, on record, I am taking up the least amount of time of the 15 minutes. Here I go. <laughs> um, thank you for having us this evening to talk about our needs at the secondary level. We're in the second year of our five-year budget. Uh, at Gibbs, specifically, we continue to enjoy being there. Um, we're very, we're getting very positive feedback from both the parent community and the student community about their respective experience. Uh, we are focusing this year on building our tier one work around social emotional learning and content area instructional best practice. And we're doing this by concentrating on building a robust responsive classroom philosophy, developing a project block curriculum that builds various necessary sixth grade skills and supporting teachers instructional pedagogy through coaching and special education support. This work is also allowing us to define our tier two and tier three intervention we are having discussions about what we do for all students, identified as needing access to this kind of intervention, and as a result, are developing more comprehensive interventions and are beginning to be able to define our gaps and needs around professional development. Uh, before I get into thinking through that lens and, and talking about our direct requests, I think this work has been very, we're very fortunate to have this school, first of all. So we're in year two now, and we're, we're really finding our way through what, how important it is to have a tier one, a solid tier one plan. Um, and I think that in being able to do that work, we're now able to see what we have to do to get a tier two and a tier three intervention program up and really running. So when I see we're able to identify gaps 
you know, I, I feel lucky to be in that position because I think it's one, when you've actually been able to really identify where you need the help, you can start to plan and put in place professional development that's going to give us the things and the strength and the confidence for teachers to be able to meet the needs of the kids in the classrooms. Um, so before I asked for some specific things, I wanted to really drive that point home. It's, it's that tier one work that we're, we're fortunate enough to build from scratch um, here at Gibbs that is really allowing us the opportunity to do that. So to continue to sustain that work next year, we will need to think about enrollment growth and professional development. Through that lens, our, our requests related directly to staffing are as follows, and there really aren't that many. I'm, we're pretty well staffed there at the moment, uh, but we, we would like a 0.2 increase in math intervention, bringing our 0.8 interventionist to full-time, and I can talk a little bit more about that if there's questions. Uh, a 0.3 increase in world language to mitigate a 250-plus student caseload in Spanish. And I can talk a little bit more about that if there's questions as well. And a 0.2 increase in physical education to bring our total phys ed education staff to 2.0. And again, I can also speak to that if necessary. Um, our non-staffing priorities are as follows. Uh, funding for Wilson training to support the number of students entering sixth grade needing tier three reading intervention, um, directly re related to what you just heard about here with literacy coaches in the elementary school. So I can draw some, some parallels there, connect some dots um, following my asks. Um, funding to train new staff members in responsive classroom. So we were fortunate enough to have all, almost all of our, our staff members at the beginning of last year funded to have the training, but now we've added new staff members on, so we need to think about getting them that training as well. Um, in addition to that, we want to be able to sustain the responsive classroom training for all staff. So it's not one and done for sure. Uh, we need to put things in place that help continue to have that good work all over our building. Funding to maintain and continue the growth of co-teaching training. Um, and I've been partnering with Allison Elmer with that. Um, and it's something that we've launched this year. I can certainly talk more about if people have questions. Funding to maintain the efforts around project block, advisory, and co-teaching through our think tanks. Uh, and our think tanks are teacher buy-in, teacher-led. So those are the groups we've made within our school uh, where teachers have had certain interest and entry points, and they're the one presenting at faculty meetings, and they're the ones doing research and getting themselves some PD. So it's, it's been a very effective, more than I even could have imagined, way um, to lift some of these new things teachers are doing off the ground. So I'm very pleased with that work. And that's it. I, I thank you again for having us this evening. I look forward to continuing this work at Gibbs, uh, as well as working to vertically align with elementary schools and the Audison in the high school. Uh, we appreciate your support each year, and we know that we couldn't have gotten this really great opportunity for sixth graders off the ground without the support from this committee. So uh, we're really enjoying that support, and I think kids and parents are really happy, which makes me really happy. So thank you. Why don't, why don't we move on? Okay. So I wanted to thank you for the opportunity to uh, listen to the budget request from the Audison Middle School. I also wanted to thank the school committee and the voters of Arlington for passing the override last year. Um, that really made a difference, I think, this year with education and going forward. So I just wanted to acknowledge people for the override. There are 900 students currently at the Audison Middle School. Um, next year projections look like we'll be adding about 40 students, so we'll be up to about 940 students at the Audison. Um, I have some needs that I think are very much enrollment based, and I have some other things that as I take, you know, kind of the principal's role the second year as I'm looking around and finding out things that we might need for um, certain students to do better here at the middle school level. Um, the first request is a .2 PE teacher. Um, currently, right now, we have 38 sections of uh, physical education. Um, that's compared with 40 sections of art, facts, and technology. Um, I would like them to all be even. There's one part, it's a scheduling, but also it would reduce the class sizes from 24.7 next year to 23.4. Uh, we do have a teacher right now who is 0.8. Um, I think it would be very easy to uh, hopefully make her full time. 
uh, a point to Spanish teacher with the 40 new students coming in. Spanish is by far our largest language and we need to see one more section. Currently there are eight sections in eighth grade that are um, for 205 students. Adding an extra section would reduce class sizes from 25.7 students to 22.8 students. I would also like to have half a learning team be added. It looks like right now at the Gibbs there's 485 students. If we currently have the four learning communities, teachers would be responsible for 121 students per learning community. Um, class sizes would be average of about 24.2. If we could have four and a half learning communities, that would reduce the learning communities to 108 students, one being 54 obviously for the half, and that would reduce class sizes to 21.6. With the additional half of a learning community, I'm looking to add a special educator who could work with that new learning community, but also could help us cope with co-teaching and inclusion as our special education numbers are growing. I'm looking for a 1.0 bridge teacher. So we are working currently right now we are looking at other schools that have a bridge program. A bridge program is for kids who are for school refusal or coming back from hospitalization. Unfortunately, I'm seeing a greater need as more kids have trouble with stress and anxiety and depression. I'm seeing more kids refusing to either come to school or coming back from partial or full program hospitalizations. Um, so I'm also looking to offer that services. Right now, typically what happens for kids who are missing a lot of school, either if they're hospitalized or if they're school refusal, a lot of times they end up in special education and I find the next step is if they're really struggling, might be out of district placement. So I am hoping to stem the tide and hopefully give these kids what they need. Um, looking for a point one administrative assistant as we get more people. I think it's a uh, greater stress on the secretarial staff that we have. I'd like to increase three TAs that we have. We're having trouble maintaining and retaining good teaching assistants. Right now in the REACH and the COMPASS program, they are paid at a regular teaching assistant rate. I would like to bump them up to BSPs like they are in the high school. It's about a $5,000 raise for three teachers to maintain them, um, but I also think it's an equity issue um, with the high school. Um, other requests, uh, a point for math teachers, we're seeing more kids needing Math support, we're also seeing some kids who are ELL students who are far below grade level that we need to service. And a point for computer science teacher. Currently we have 2.6 computer science teachers. Um, at the middle school, computer science is an elective. We have over 200 seventh graders who decided to take computer science. It is mandatory in sixth grade. We had a lot more seventh graders who wanted to take computer science than eighth grade. And I think we will see a continued growth in the number of kids who opt into our computer science program. So I'd be happy to take any other questions. Um, I did not go into, but I definitely wanted to also plug that there are some supply issues, um, notably in art and I think in facts that might need to be increased as well. So it's funny how the, the different structures of each organization cause us to cut through the same sort of basic questions in different ways. Um, and I'm going to try to do a little of what both folks did because it's nice to hear. It's nice to go third because um, you can get to play off of that a little bit. So first, I do absolutely want to thank the voters. I'd like to thank the school committee. I'd like to thank um, as well our teachers um, for the amazing progress we've made at Arlington High School and in the district as a whole. Any good result we've gotten in Arlington High School is a result of the folks that go before that make us look good. Um, and so it really is an entire district that does that. 
Um, and every time I get in front of a microphone, I think it's important in a world where we often talk about our failures. In fact, we'll be talking about some of our failures in the later presentation today because every disciplinary incident is something that we feel as a failure. But in a world where we talk about our failures, it's important to remember that Arlington High School, which is currently at 1,415 students and is slated to be at 1,500 plus next year, um, is part of a district in which we are regularly recognized as one of the top schools in the state, and the state is recognized as one of the top states in the country. And if this state, I say this over and over again, but I think it's important to emphasize, we talk a lot about international comparisons, but if Massachusetts were a country, it would be at the top of many of the international comparisons. Um, and so it's important to, do, to understand that as we're thinking about, you know, the really excellent district we have, and then the very important work we need to do to make sure that we serve all of our students and that we serve all of the students in, as a whole person, not just as a test score or a small outcome, because there's always more we can do for our kids. Um, the major, um, I organized my little presentation, which I shared with all of you, um, around extending the five-year plan that we talked about last year forward. And if you look, you'll see that the, the trend lines, the basic categories in terms of what things we're looking at remain the same. The main things that are driving Arlington High School's budgetary costs um, are enrollment, <coughs> the new building project, and those really kind of structure everything. Within that budget, our major <coughs> initiatives have been for the last three years, social emotional learning, equity and diversity, and rigorous education. And I think we've made progress in all of those areas, but there's still a lot of work to be done. Um, so, Doing this sort of within also the high school is a funny thing because we ask for money now em emphasizing sort of a number of staff in increases around areas we're going to put resources, but we have a much higher component of choice. And so the students then tell us what classes they're going to take in January and in February we figure out how to staff those and begin off and posting them. So the, the good news is that a lot of the time we're able to push certain things forward and shift things around <coughs> in terms of trying to be really efficient in how we use the money while keeping the ratio of staffing the same. So if you look at this year, um, I have a whole discussion in here about what I call multipliers. And the simple, uh, the sort of simple math of a high school um, staffing is that there are seven periods during the day and if you put 20 kids in every class and you want to put a teacher in front of them, for every 20 new kids, you need 1.4 teachers. Um, and if you decide you're gonna put 25 kids in front of them, then for every 25 kids, you need 1.4 teachers. Mm -hmm. um, the MSBA has called, calls for ratios of 20. That, in terms of fairness and sort of equity across our district, is not what we end up looking for or targeting, but it's an important thing to think about. So the multiplier that we look at in terms of looking at keeping things constant is at the moment 25. Um, if you then go back and look at a building which is designed to have one dean for every 500 students and the <coughs> standards which cause us to have one counselor for every 250 students and our rate of um, special education which ranges between 11 and 14 percent um, within the high school over various different periods of time, you'd be looking at additional staffing along with that as you have those enrollment increases. If you calculate that out based on those recommended ratios, I get a multiplier of 1.83. Going back to what I said before about 25 kids, we're working from a multiplier of 1.7. So then what I can do is look out over the next five years, because I can't hire teachers in, I have a spreadsheet of this, in 0 0.23, 0 0.6, you know, a tenth of a spe speech and language pathologist. We're gonna squeeze out until we get over enrollment and then we're gonna add half of a person here and then we're gonna be a little ahead here and a little behind here and add half of a person there. But that's the logic of the spreadsheet that we have here. And so the simple math, and I'll, I'll leave it to you because you guys are smart folks, you've read this in advance, um, and I only get three minutes because I gotta be shorter than uh, Ms. Delfort and Kristen, um, is um, that the simple math is that within the core content areas of classroom teachers, um, we, anticipate needing an additional uh, five teachers. So that's for math, English, science, social studies, world language, um, ELL, and, um, and the elective classes. Last year we put, we were really fortunate that you folks were able to give us enrollment, um, staffing growth that kept track with our enrollment growth. That had not been our experience at the high school because there was so much growth in the elementary schools prior to that. 
you were not able to give us staffing that kept um, up with what we call historic understaffing, and you'll notice I've just left that zeroed at this point um, because I don't imagine there's going to be a time when we're going to be sort of getting ahead in that. We put the enrollment, la the staffing last year towards getting our, those core content areas, math, English, science, social studies, and world language up to reasonable ratios, and so for this next year, our staffing in those will all be just to keep track with enrollment. So we'll be adding between a 0.8 for four more sections or 1.0 to hire an entire person. And then the rest of that staffing goes to where we've consistently understaffed, which has been in what we call electives, but is actually the arts and electives, because arts is a requirement and PE. Um, and so we will add a few sections where we can. We won't add as many sections as we might need, and an example of that would be in family and consumer science, where we could fill, we could have filled last year five more sections with one more teacher. They would have all been full. Even if um, I had the money to hire one point oh fax teacher, family and consumer science teacher, I won't have a lab for the next three years consistently in which to be able to run those programs. So we'll be putting it more into arts and other areas. Um, so those are the major areas there. Um, in terms of non-staffing, um, there is a digital technology plan, and I just talk a little bit about technology here. I don't put numbers in because that's something that David Good will be putting into there. And then I go back to the building. It's important to remember that we're going to be in this tired old building, at least parts of it, for another five years. Um, and so we are already over full. Our, sta our classroom usage right now <coughs> is well over 90 percent. And it's a hard thing to sort of... Is that? Oh. It's, a, it, it's a hard thing to understand that 85 percent 80 to 85 percent classroom usage is full um, because when you get over 90 or 95 percent the only way to make that work is if teachers are running from classroom to classroom over every corner of the building and you can't possibly do that nor do all the classrooms accommodate all of the different things people do right now we are beyond full last year we needed three new classrooms we squeezed one because the lab program shrank their space Next year, because of the building project and the move to the Parmenter by the preschool, we get seven new classrooms, which is awesome, um, but that's going to cost about $80,000 to furnish and supply. We won't be building the walls or the paint. That's all part of the building project, but that's a corner of the building that's going to have a physics lab in it. If they're going to need another Chromebook cart, that's, program. that's a big chunk of change that I wanted to mention in here. Um, and then... Um, last but not least, things I just want to make sure that we take count of. There are small asks in the larger spreadsheet that I know Dr. Bodie will be sharing with you. But um, one, as we grow, a family and consumer science section requires more food be eaten. When an art section requires more stuff gets painted. So for those consumable programs, there will be an ask connected to supplies. And then last but not least, we have decided to move the start time, we've all been here before, 30 minutes back. There will be costs associated with that <coughs> in terms of the preschool, in terms of coverage, and in terms of you know, dealing with students who are coming in from Boston and might be here earlier or later. Those moving pieces are still there, but that's something that will be part of the various lists. So thank you very much for your time. All right, great, Mr. Smith. Well, you know what? I forgot to mention the special education line. So can I jump back? Yes, go ahead. I was like, what am I forgetting? So just quickly, we asked, I asked for a 1.0 here, if you look, for special education. I wasn't sure which category to put it in, but half of it is listed, I'm sorry, uh, where is it? Uh, point four, 6 is listed as special education, and point 4 is listed as related service provider. Um, that's actually covering a bunch of different needs. One, we're expecting to have 20 additional special education students, so that would be a 1.0 caseload. Um, we also have a shortage in terms of speech and language pathology. There's a, so, a lot of need between that and reading, and so we're looking to expand the services there, and we're expanding the co-teaching. So the co-teaching program is something you can look at there. I'd love to come back and talk about that as well, um, that we've now expanded to really be serious about inclusion around the entire school. So students that would have been in a small group English class, a small group math class, um, Isolate, not, A, not being taught the content by a content area teacher, and B, not with, with peers who are achieving at a college and career ready level. Um, we've worked to get, one, the curriculum up to where all of those students were receiving a curriculum, a curriculum, and then to move them into an inclusion setting. We still need to add sections in science because we didn't, had not staffed that program yet, and we need an additional section in math in order to spread the students <coughs> out to have an inclusion model. Thank you. Sorry.
Uh, okay, go ahead, Mr. Schoen. Okay, I want to preface this first by saying over the past few months, I have been hearing a lot of people come to me and tell me what a wonderful job you guys and your staff are doing. The, the feedback I'm getting from the Gibbs is marvelous. The relationships that the three of you are building with parents and kids are very positive. I'm hearing a lot of great feedback. Um, uh, and uh, Dr. Jangare, I also appreciate the way you're thinking and outlining your budget. I've scheduled a high school, and, and I see how the component parts fit in. Um, basically, the, the only thing I'd ask you, I, I'm, I'm impressed by the three, the three of you. The, the requests are relatively modest, in my opinion. I, I opened the uh, Novus document and uh, was uh, calmed by the... <laughs> Uh, how, how reasonable everything seems. Oh, wait, I, I have another list. <laughs> yeah, 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 okay, fine. Um, uh, Dr. Jagger, how much duct tape do you need? <laughs> um, my curiosities are in a couple of places, and, and, and it's just me being, trying to think this out, because it, it's, everything's well thought out. It's a Gibbs, 0. 0.3 Spanish? I mean, how do you get to 0. 0.3 in, in a traditional schedule? I think that's going to cover our numbers. We're also hoping that we were going to find a way to combine it with another ask at one of the other schools and maybe do some combination. <coughs> because when I look at a schedule, I'm usually thinking each, each class period for teachers a point two. So, I'm, uh, so how many Spanish teachers do you have and why point I three? Have, why is I it have, a point two or a point four? I have one. Uh huh. And I think if I'm being honest, when Dawn and I spoke about it, she said, well, let's, well, let's split the difference. <laughs> um, so, you know, would I take a point four? Sure. I'd take a point four. Um, I, I don't I think see how point three works. Point I mean, three I'll cut you to a point two and I'll, or raise you to point four, but I just don't point, understand point three. Point three would cover our numbers. That's, okay. if, if we're looking at our numbers, that would cover our numbers. Is it realistic that we're necessarily going to find one person to do point three? Well, we've got someone doing Mandarin point two five right now, so that was a really good find. So, <laughs> there you go. all of the negotiations and uh, Addison point oh, point one administrative assistant. Yeah, so my idea is that we're growing by forty. So right now uh -huh. we have two point six. Right now, so the point six comes in Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, mm -hmm. and her chief responsibility right now does a lot of the guidance schedule, private school applications, fills in for the other teacher, does a lot around MCAS and projects, and as you have 40 more students, that's more applications, more meeting, more parents calling, but not necessarily. So I'm trying to figure out, there used to be, as I understand it, three um, administrative assistants mm -hmm. when they were about 1,200 kids at the Audison, mm -hmm. and so I almost see it incrementally growing as we get closer to that number of 1,150 kids, 1,200. Can you logistically so, do a point one on this? Because it seems like a relatively small. Hours. No, mm -hmm. Yeah, I know for hours, yeah. but you know. Yeah, the, and the the person that I've talked to would be doing then an extra morning on one day, so it'd be three and a half days. I'd probably come back to if we had another forty, fifty kids asking another point one, four mm -hmm. to five, and eventually getting up hopefully two, three full time administrative assistants. So I'm just kind of going back where there used to be three for about twelve hundred kids. Right now, we have, we're going to have 950, just trying to figure out what I think makes sense. Uh, so. Community learning teachers, I guess that's... Uh, the old cluster the teachers? Old we, yeah, we yeah, just yeah. renamed it. We just renamed it. Uh, so we uh, thought uh, it was <laughs> easier. Um, so they call them learning communities at the Gibbs. Mm -hmm. So we thought we would follow suit. Um, I also, in a just kind of maybe general thing, when I use the word cluster, a lot of time it doesn't have a positive connotation. So I thought learning communities would be a little bit better, it'd be a little bit easier. So we've switched to learning communities, but if this was two years ago, I'd say 2.0 cluster teachers. Yeah, a a adding a half cluster. Yes. Yeah, okay, fine. Yep. Yep. Yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm with you on that. Yeah. Uh, and the facts, supply, the facts and art supplies, uh, 
I can't imagine teaching art without the requisite supplies. And are, are, are we thin now? I think we're thin right now. When I talked to um, David Ardito, who I think is in the back, and I talked to my two art teachers right now, mm -hmm. they're constantly scrambling for supplies. Um, you know, I, I get a lot of emails of, please bring in cardboard boxes. We've decided to do something else. Mm -hmm. If anyone's still getting their papers in the morning, uh, you know, we're constantly getting things. Mm -hmm. And um, as we get more students, I think we're going to need more supplies, and it also gives leeway to do more creative projects. <laughs> just just oh, doubling down on that. Yeah. Um, we've done the math. They, they go at about 50 to 80 cents per kid per day, right? Like yeah. when you think about how much money they're spending, they're, they're, you know, mm -hmm. my son said, I don't know how they do it. I'm never hungry at the end of fax class. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, yeah, and because you, both of you have uh, put the same request in. It, 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 yes. Yeah, okay, I, I'm, I'm seeing your issue too. Thanks for the uh, thoughtful presentation and looking at botanists. Is, is, it looks reasonable and realistic and, and something that I'd love to support. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so yeah, so I, I spent an evening for fun um, looking at enrollment numbers and comparing it to the McKibben report and it was really interesting. So we're seeing a trend that I think is gonna continue probably until we get the new high school, which is, and, and especially after opening GIPS, which is that we are having a hundred or even more retention from fifth grade to sixth grade. So last year it was 101, mm -hmm. um, but we're seeing a falling off now at the high school. So we get, so last year was 88% retention. Now I suspect that as we're doing the construction and things are really difficult, that we won't get, I mean, I know your numbers are based on 100% retention from eighth grade to ninth grade, that we just won't get that number. So just in terms of as we're thinking about what our enrollment pressures look like to realize what the current trends have been, what they're likely to be in the future, and, um, and of course, everything's gonna change dramatically as we get to the high school. Mm -hmm. Now, I do have to say, so I, so I don't quite think we're gonna get 105 people. I do have to say, though, that I do think it's true that in the last few years, we sort of shorted the high school a little bit because the, there was so much pressure at the elementary school level. And so we saw classroom numbers increase more than we're happy with. But, but just sort of to keep all that stuff in mind. Go ahead, Mr. Changer. So you're right. Um, I mean, traditionally, when you open a new building, you get a bump. Mm -hmm. So Minuteman's getting a bump up. Mm -hmm. And when you start to construct a new building, you get a bump down. Right. Um, so our range, full disclosure, because I've done it both ways, the, the 105 is based on the five-year historical average, which is about 94.5%. Uh, I think what's the number here? I, th uh, I think the number is exactly the number, the difference is 100%. Not in my spreadsheet. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, the 105 I'm doing is based on the sort of spreadsheet, the actual enrollment and, like, as of when we started the budget process and this. Um, but if you went with the retention last year, we'd only get 58 students. Um, and so um, we're going to be in that range. Yeah, I think, I think as we develop the budget, we need to have some common assumptions of what we think the likely enrollment at the high school is gonna be. And the budget subcommittee can look at that as part of the, mm -hmm. since you're basing it off of a formula, you know, that would, that would you know. Yeah. Other questions? Uh, go ahead, Dr. Austin. Um, Dr. Jinger, you have a couple items in your uh, list, and this question is not just so much for you, but also for Dr. Bodhi. Um, one is the changes in the space as the preschool moves to the parmenter. So I understand the construction, the, the new construction is covered by building committee, but is the furnishings and stuff, it cannot be? Oh. I mean, because it's it's swing space, we're creating it swing be. space. It could, it could be. Um, okay. We were, waiting to see what happens with the, the building piece in terms of the construction cost, the mm -hmm. swing space costs. I think it's starting to get more definite as we go along, but we, we've tried, we're trying, we've had some discussions about whether we get the new furniture now, but we haven't gone through the process of deciding what. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the easiest thing to do would be to you know, forage in our own district first and then see where we can get 
um, furniture that is being sh shifted out of another school. Um, we're going to look into that, but I think that's a pretty decent estimate of what we're going to have to do for, because the furniture that's there now, of preschool furniture, that's mm -hmm. going over there. Um, but we have to have for open classrooms. We don't really have extra rooms of furniture here. Okay. It's not. It's not really swing space. It's expansion space. We're not closing any space and moving over there. I guess that's true. Yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. So. When we have opened classrooms in the past, mm -hmm. we've estimated the cost at $15,000, mm -hmm. but because the building project is gonna be absorbing a lot of the cost of fixing up the space, electrical, mm -hmm. that kind of stuff, I took that out of there, okay. um, and we are gonna forge furniture because there's no reason to buy that. This is really furniture, unless we went and bought what we're gonna buy going forward and that doesn't seem reasonable. Right. This is gonna be furniture we're gonna use for three or four years and then sell to somebody else, mm -hmm. um, and or we'll repurpose it in the building. Mm -hmm. um, I would not expect that the projectors, the Chromebooks, the physics supplies are going to be covered by the MSBA. So that's mm -hmm. what I was estimating in that amount. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the second question is about the security guard position that you're asking for. Um, it says, with construction on the front lawn and the building being made both more hazardous and porous by the presence of construction activities, we've requested a, a 1.0 FT security guard position to supervise the high school site after hours. And again, I'm just wondering, is that a building project related cost or? I don't think so. I don't think so. Um, plus we're gonna have two entrances next year, mm -hmm. which is another issue. But um, we're, we're in transition meetings now, as you know, and I think the security is one of the things that's definitely on our discussion and so we're identifying that this is maybe very necessary and it probably would have to come from the operating budget. Okay. Has the security been part of the contract with the builder? On our other construction areas and stuff, they, they did security at uh, Hardy, they did security up at uh, all the other schools. There'll be security. But what I'm saying is the security uh, for the, the site was, was built into the contracts for the, the thing and not carried by the, by the school themselves. The security of the site is part of the contract. What Dr. Jang is talking about is a, a, a another person. That's not usually in the contract. We didn't have that in the contract to Stratton. We did not have a security person. We had what, security what, 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 cameras. Had, didn't we have it at Hardy? Uh, not Hardy, I'm sorry, Thompson, when they redid uh, the whole school over there? Well, it's, it's something to look into. Oh, okay, fine. Yeah. I don't think it should be part of our budget. I think it should be part of the contract with the builder. That's all I'm saying. Ms. Morgan, do you want to go next? <clears throat> oh, I sure do. Um, so I really appreciated how, so I didn't expect to come here tonight and say, let's take the FY21 column from the five-year plan and like, we'll be out of here in like 10 seconds because it's like, oh, we just want those things. Um, but what I really like is how you tailored your presentations to sort of like bring us back to that so that we're all speaking with this common language, which was really great. Um, so I have really quick questions for Mr. Merringer, whether your budget asks are in order of priority or not. Are they prioritized or no? Um, they are not. Okay. Um, and then um, for, um, for Ms. DeFrancisco, have you, well, I know you haven't because I have two fifth graders and I assume they haven't been surveyed about their language needs. So I'm just curious why, so I can see why at the Audison or at, the, at Arlington High School, you would have a pretty good sense of like, well, we've got this whole, these kids want to take Spanish or all these kids want to take French because like by and large, they sort of progress, right? So it's easier for Brian to probably prognosticate on his foreign language than for you because we don't really know. So I guess I'm curious why, what if all these fifth graders want to take French? Historically, if we're going on the data historically, year after year, mm -hmm. Spanish is always the most. The, you know, so if we're basing it on that, historically, that's what we see. In addition to that, it's currently, she currently has very large classes and she's teaching five instead of four. So she's not teaching a project block. She's not teaching advisory. Um, we had to take those, we couldn't have, we couldn't have done it on four classes. So um, that's the, that's the other reason for, <laughs> and because posters fall, no. That's the other reason for, for the ask. I think not only are we anticipating that it's gonna stay at 250, it currently, I mean, it's, it's there now, was there last year. 
So we had to do the same thing this year. So this is based on those two years of data plus the historical data before the sixth grade existed. So. And then the point two for the math. So we added, so correct me if I'm wrong, last year we did the point eight mm -hmm. so that we could take the math resource teachers and actually have math projects. Correct. Which seems like a win. Mm -hmm. Like Huge. seems like a really good idea. So then we added the point eight and then this is just to fill that out because we expect Numbers are we bigger. have more kids. And is there reason to expect that we have more kids who need math intervention coming? So Matt Coleman, who isn't here tonight, but is the data man. I mean, he does a, a lot of good um, predicting about what we're going to need. I mean, that ask is from both he and I. And we, um, <coughs> as he's looking at the numbers of kids coming up that are currently taking math intervention, there's an increase there. In addition to that, the kids that are currently at Gibbs, those classes are a little bit bigger than we would like to see them, um, and, but, but are working. So that was the, the other piece is that they're noticing growth there for kids um, and better access to classroom, to the, to the time in the classroom. So ha having that point too will do two things. Number one, it will service the larger number that's coming in. And number two, it will also make it a little bit more manageable of a size. So perfect. Thank yeah. you. You're welcome. Mr. Thielman. Thank you, Lynn. Uh, <clears throat> so my question is, when you add up all of the um, positions do they are they within the the confines of the FY21 plan of the five year plan FY21 uh, budget of the five year plan? You, have you? Uh, You're asking all of us to get. Yeah, I, I'm asking. I checked. Me. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, so so in in the request list, yes. Yes. So yes. Okay. So it add, okay. So everything. But that's not what we got fund. That's what we, want. Right. we don't have funds to fulfill the entire five year request. Remember. Right. Okay. So, so right. in the request, but not in the actual. What Correct. Was, we this. never we never went back and cut down the plan to match our budget. Okay, right. that's what I was curious about. So right. the, yeah. the conversation right. about priorities, I presume, is going to be between you and the team. Right. And they come back to us because yes. you're not asking us to make a decision about whether we. Not yet. Um, you certainly once you get the superintendent's budget, you have every year spoken uh, yeah. about requests that you have that may then. Um, change some of our requests. But we've already talked about this as administrative team. We know that the sum total, just even right now, from secondary level, exceeds what we think might be yeah. the budget. We're trying to get really uh, clear on this, and it's a very tedious process because what it means, it's not a simple rollover of personnel because each person may have, you might kick in longevity for one person, a new step, or, and so each one has to be done individually. And so Mr. Mason's in that process. But we already know, just now, yeah. we've exceeded what we think we're going to probably be. And um, we have the elementary. Right. Yeah, yeah, they're um, coming, huh? I, right. So <clears throat> we know, and we've done this every year. It's important, I think, for you to yeah. hear and for the community to hear what the situation is in each school. But then we will, we will as a team, work on what are the priorities and that will then become the the ask in the new the new budget okay so mm -hmm. i mean i'm not going to ask you to we had this analogy last night at the but but about the this mm -hmm. building committee meeting we're not, not going to ask you which of your children to pick but uh <laughs> um <clears throat> so uh so I'm not, I, I don't want i don't actually I, you can answer the question i think right now what your priorities are going to be but just kind of like what could you just kind of tell the us and the public maybe Kind of as you go into this kind of this dialogue between you guys and the superintendent and the rest of the staff, are you going to be thinking about enrollment? Um, I mean, what's going to drive your decisions, I guess, about deciding what you're going to recommend to us ultimately? I think this particular year, at least if I speak for, for Gibbs, and I think I can safely speak for Brian, we're also looking, where it's a five-year plan, we're also looking at the numbers below in all of these grades. When third grade comes to Gibbs, there are 540 kids in third grade right now. Yeah. If we maintain that number, my enrollment asks are going to have to be larger. Um, so for me, I'm not asking for a lot of FTE, and I, I purposefully looked at that very carefully. Maybe that's why I asked for the point three. Um, because of the, as I said, as we identify these gaps, I want to really train the teachers that I have. I really want them to be able to have the professional development they need to launch all of these things that we say are going to be 
integral for their, their launch into 6 to 12. So I think, you know, my priority, while I, I want to be able to run these, these sections at a smaller yeah. size, and I, I, you know, I want to be able to mitigate that Spanish, uh, there's not a lot of ask as far as Gibbs is concerned for FTEs because I really feel like that professional development, which you'll start to see when you hear about special education. So I think Allison will probably talk about co-teaching a little bit. And when Dr. Bodhi presents you her budget and what we have in there for PD, that's where I, I guess I would be drawing from. So for me, um, you know, I think I'm looking down the road more for my enrollment growth because it's going to happen. Your third grade, when they come up, that we're going to need to have some bigger asks for enrollment. Um, right now, we're we're maintaining pretty pretty consistently. Does that make sense? Yeah, I would also say that you know, as one of the other things we're doing right now is we're presenting what we would really like to have right now, and we understand there's budget constraints, and <laughs> I think there's multiple people that we need to collaborate as well when we talk about the budget. So one of the things that happens is I look from a lens of the building. But I know that there are curriculum directors who look through kind of vertically and think of what they need to do and where they can fit certain goals. So what I like to do is be able to talk to the curriculum directors because they also have a different view of things that they, we think that we need. And sometimes that's a blind spot for me. And I think we also try to collaborate a little bit together so that we can come up with, gee, I can understand why this is important for you. I'm willing to, you know, maybe it's a little bit more important that you have this FTTE, maybe it, you know, and maybe we kind of go back and forth and hopefully we can work together. So I don't know if there's any strict, like I can right now go one through nine. So when uh, Ms. Morgan asked, like, was it a priority list? There are certain things that I think are important, and we're also speaking for some of the curriculum directors of what they think is important, and we're, I think we've tried to give you our best guess of the things that we would love to have, but we also know that, as Dr. Bodie said, we're asking for more than we will probably have available, and so we need to go through and have decisions and talk about what's important for us to pare down the list a little bit, unfortunately, and we also need to talk to the curriculum directors because they need to have say in their departments and what they need as well. Um, you made me just think about when Brian and I were talking too as well. I know that I know the cohort that's coming up currently. I know those kids. I know what they're doing. I know what they're used to. I know the sizes. And so when I hear you are asking for an additional half cluster, I want him to get that half cluster because we, you know, we just at Gibbs worked to get them to a place where they're going to really be able to access. I want them to be able to access. So, you know, while I do need these people, I tried to be as conservative as I could because I also know the money is only going to go so far. And so I really, I think that through line is important. Um, so it's my responsibility to listen to Brian, too, and say, you know, these are our kids coming to you. Um, and I think, you know, he, we do that collectively with, with Matt, too. So I guess that would be what we would want the community to know. Did you have another add? I do want to echo, I mean, one of the things that's really nice about the structure of Arlington and the strong curriculum directors is that they really are looking particularly at the secondary level at that through line. And so when we are doing our weighting of sort of what things we're going to have, you know, somebody will say, you know, well, that's great, but they're going to need X, Y, or Z at the middle school too because, you know, they're having these same issues and the same things. I think if we're asked to prioritize, we're going to do what we've always done at the high school level, which is we have to prioritize the required classes. Um, what that means at the high school level is losing diversity, losing enrichment, losing programs. So the options that are available for kids outside of the core content areas become significantly less. Kids have a harder time getting interesting things in their schedule. Standalone classes um, suffer as a result of that. Um, all right, I'm, Thank you. I'm up next, I think, right? Everybody else, everyone. Um, uh, so, Ms. Francisco, at, at some point it would be great to, I'd love to hear more about what a social and emotional learning intervention model looks like, what a tiers are. Not really related to this, maybe with Sarah Bird, you can come back at some point, but it'd be, a, a, I think, a great thing for us to hear about. Um, Mr. Merringer, so 
if you add a half cluster to seventh grade this year, if, next year, the following year, you're going to want to add a half cluster to eighth grade, I presume, as those kids move up. Correct. Right. Does it, to find, for, the, for one year, to find teachers that can teach both two subjects, and then next year you don't really need them to teach two <coughs> subjects, but they could teach two grades instead of two subjects, does that, is that going to work? Is that doable, or does it? I think when we've had, um, and I think Jason Levy was a... Uh, half clustered teacher back in the day. Um, I think we we have been able to find those people. So last year we had, um, before we were granted another half cluster, half learning community, we had one in eighth grade. So I think at the middle school level, you can still find that history slash English teacher, that science slash math teacher okay. right now. Um, so if I look at the, you know, in eighth grade, Nikki Hochter and Susan Stewart were both um, had a half cluster. I think they did a wonderful job, and then they were able to go back to the, you know, the subjects of their choice. But I think they did an excellent job. So I actually think there's a great likelihood that we'll find great candidates for that. Great. And then, Dr. Jinger. We, we weren't able to get you all of your requests last year, but I just want to make sure you did get the six FTE, because that was more than, more than the enrollment increase, but not the full yeah. extra, right? You were pretty generous last year. <laughs> I, I mean, I really appreciated it. We were able to do a lot of interesting things with programming, a lot of things with staffing, you know, for the co-teaching was helpful um, in terms of being able to staff, uh, to get sections in some really specific, important areas to smaller class sizes, the English math class sizes. Like right now in the core content area, the class sizes are pretty good. So we're really, we run into two funny problems with staffing. <coughs> One is we're just expecting a bunch of kids. And so if you get 100 new kids, you still need four more sections of, mm -hmm. of English. Um, the other thing is that we were very <laughs> creative about using everything to get everything. So we had split teachers and all those things. And so we don't have a lot of stubs of teachers where we can add a couple of sections. So one of the things that will happen, for example, which, which, which he is able to do is we would, if we had fewer than what we're looking at, have to do things like hiring high school teachers who are English social studies or one English teacher versus one social studies teacher. Um, and at the high school level, particularly in the math and the sciences, th there's nobody out there. I mean, we, um, you know, we get this many, social studies must be the best job in the world because we get this many applications. English is second, guidance is pretty good. Um, but math and science, we get great people and I got to give a shout out to Matt Coleman, also known as Billy Bean. I don't know where he finds them, but he's already found them before we even post. I mean, he just knows where people are. He's reaching out to people. He draws people from a lot of really great places. Um, if everybody else could figure out how to do that, we'd have a lot of advantages. Um, but it's a lot to do in order to staff that. But yeah, it was helpful. Great. great. All right. Anything else? Great. Can Thank I, you all for it. Oh, go ahead. Say, I'd like to acknowledge the curriculum directors who are here to support the presentation. We have Bill Papasisis for Performing Arts. We have David Ardito for Visual Arts. We have Denny Conklin for Social Studies. And we have Cindy Bouvier for Health. Thank Great. You. Thank you all for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Next up is the AEA. Budget needs requests for high school and middle school. Ms. Keys, welcome back <laughs> to the guest table today. And I have so much space compared to everybody else. <laughs> we can get a few other people to sit with you. you know. I'm, I'm good. I'll be fast. Um, thank you all for giving the Arlington <coughs> Education Association the opportunity to share our budget request with you for the 2020 to 2021 school year. Uh, my name is Juliana Keyes. I'm the second vice president of the AEA, and I'm a teacher at the Audison Middle School. Most of our requests stem from our growing enrollment and the need to add staff to teach students. I'd like to highlight some of those requests with you um, that you'll find in the document that we submitted. Um, I'm also going to cover a few requests that are sort of district-wide, not specifically elementary or secondary. Um, and most of those <coughs> center around curriculum and professional development. Um, in terms of curriculum, as we shift to more and more digital-based curriculum, instead of buying one set of textbooks that last for 15 years, you buy licenses to online mm -hmm. books and curriculum materials, and those need to be renewed every few years or every year in the case of some of our curriculum. It also means that 
For example, we would love it if all of our special educators had teacher licenses to access all of those online textbooks, and, but you have to pay by the license. So we're asking that you continue to increase money for curriculum, for online subscriptions, um, for curriculum materials for our small group classes. Uh, we have a lot of small group special education classes, both for students who need a smaller, more supportive environment, um, but can do grade level material, for students who can do grade level material but need a little more teacher intervention than they would get in a mainstream classroom, and for students who aren't working at grade level. Um, and they all need all of the same curricular materials that are being provided to the mainstream classes, including teacher textbooks, manipulatives, and such. Um, and then finally, increase funding for science materials and consumables. That's the elementary school FOSS kits all the way up to our new iScience curriculum in the middle and high middle schools. So. Um, we like increased funding for professional development. One of the great perks of working at Arlington is that there is some course reimbursement for teachers, but we've been burning through the budget item for that in the past few years. So we'd like that to continue to be a perk of teaching in Arlington rather than having teachers who are working on master's programs or something being told, sorry, the money's all been spent this year. Um, we'd also like more specific targeted training for our BSPs, our behavior support people. Um, they are on the front lines with some of our most challenging students, and it would be great if they had some more training. Um, and then we would really be like if we could get more uh, additional district psychologists and additional physical therapists, and that's simply because these people are worked to the bone. Their caseloads are more than one person can do at this point. Um, I'd like to echo our principals. We need more money for art supplies. Uh, that's something we heard from all of our art teachers from kindergarten all the way up through grade 12. And finally, continue to work on providing equitable technology throughout all of our classrooms. We do recognize that great strides have been made in the past year. Um, but you know, continuing to make sure every kid has access to technology, um, continuing to update staff devices when they break or wear out or just are too slow to work anymore. Um, and please, 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 reliable photocopiers and printers in all buildings and including any network upgrades that are necessary to do that. Um, wasting an entire prep period trying to find one working printer in a building with seemingly 18 floors um, is frustrating. So um, in terms of the high school, we want to echo what Dr. Jenger said. Um, uh, one thing that I think you'll hear from all our grade levels is increased EL, that's E-L-L, -L, um, E-S-L, the, the acronym keeps updating. Um, but English language learners, um, if we had more teachers, they could even push into classrooms with kids, which would be great. Um, the high school needs just more core subject teachers, math, PE, science, social studies, ELA, world language, facts, and performing arts, just due to numbers. Uh, at the Audison, um, the biggest ask from the teachers was more special educators uh, with the idea that every cluster learning community should have their own. Um, right now we have almost there, but not quite. So it would be great to have an additional seventh and eighth grade inclusion co-taught teacher, um, as well as another learning community. I'm gonna be bold, I want a full one. Our numbers are going up, our kids need more support. It would be great to just start us off with a full community. Um, we need another point four math teacher to do more intervention, but also, as Mr. Uh, Merringer said, because we have some EL students who are coming in who just lack schooling and just need to be caught up. So they need much more specialized instruction than they can get in a regular classroom. Additional PE, Spanish, and administrative assistance. Um, at Gibbs, our teachers definitely supported the need for more math support teachers and additional Spanish. Uh, they also said, we just need more support people and I don't care what that is, whether it's special ed or social worker or school counselors or TAs, but when one student go, has having a bad day and needs a full-time attention, even if everyone else in that classroom is losing their support. So they just need more people who can step in and help. Um, and you know, leaving that up to you fine people to decide how that money should be allocated. Um, that was the big request from our Gibbs teachers. As well as technology for special education cl classrooms. Um, when Gibbs was started, it was the idea that every kid was gonna get a Chromebook and carry it around with them. And 
um, that cha model changed last year to having Chromebooks stored in all the classrooms that the kids could access. Uh, but when kids go to their special education classrooms, they don't have those Chromebooks. So adding a few Chromebook carts for the special education classrooms it gives. Um, so this is what our teachers asked for. Um, we see our building reps went out and surveyed and gathered all this data for us, and that's what we're looking for. So any help you can give would be appreciated. Any questions? Mr. Schickman. Yeah. Okay. Uh, can you explain to me how the course reimbursement works mm -hmm. and what's the impact of the funding not keeping up with the pace? So when teachers are taking classes mm -hmm. at universities, graduate level classes, um, if they get them approved by the district ahead of time, mm -hmm. the district reimburses teachers at the average state university per credit rate which works out to be, it's, it's only a couple hundred dollars per it's, credit, mm -hmm. but it helps. Mm -hmm. um, we just had so many people accessing that in the past few years that the line item budget for that money has been spent. Okay, and, so our policy is to go to the average state rate, yes. so as the state tuition costs go up, the amount that you're eligible for goes up, because I know where I work it's a fixed amount and that fixed amount hasn't gone. It up. is. Um, it's not, it doesn't include all the fees and all of that. It's mm -hmm. just the flat tuition rate. And uh, what, And when we run out of money, we just stop. You just stop approving reimbursement. Um, Cody? Yeah. I feel strongly like Ms. Keyes, this is really important. Mm -hmm. And yes, we do go over the budget line, but we do it. Mm -hmm. because it's really important. Mm -hmm. And I really appreciate the teachers that want to do this. I mean, they have a long day, and they're, you know, a lot of the, a lot of the teachers are doing these in the evening mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or Saturdays. Yeah. So I, I do everything we can to make sure it happens. It, it, the rate has gone, uh, jumped up a lot, which was a little bit of a surprise to us because the state started shifting. They used to have, they kept the, the tuitions low, and had it in fees, and, our, and we're not, our, our formula is based on tuition. But they switched it about a year or so ago, and that was a little bit of a shock to our, but we did it. We got it covered. Yeah. Um, but I don't try to discourage. The only thing that we do look for <coughs> is to make sure that the course that's being taken is, one, is graduate level, and two, is something that uh, would be helpful in what they do what their um, teaching content areas or, their, or the specialist area. And they all, I, I can't think of a course really that hasn't been that way in a number of years. Okay, thank you. Other mm -hmm. questions? Um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just make sure. a quick comment. Um, so, so professional development, art supplies, things like uh, uh, curriculum materials, those are things that sometimes sort of get slipped under, you know, under the the headlines of the classroom teachers and things like that. So I think you know, we've tried to increase those budgets in the past years. I think we need to. We're, pl we're planning listening. to do that. And listening in fact, to we're going to probably do some increases this year. The other thing that's we're changing the structure because it used to be that uh, uh, performing arts and, and art were part of the principal's mm -hmm. um, budgets, mm -hmm. and we want to differentiate it mm -hmm. into unique okay. departments. Mm -hmm. Great. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we have the principals back up for the discipline suspension report. <coughs> Two of them, at least. Thank you. So I wanted to go over the um, Audison uh, suspension data from last year. So there were 42 incidents last year that resulted in either in-school suspension or out-of-school suspension. Out of that, there were um, 18 students that were out-of-school suspended. 24 of the incidents were in-school suspensions. In total, there were 34 students who were suspended. Obviously, 42 incidents, 34 uh, students, there were some students who were suspended multiple times. Um, I think the, the, some of the key takeaways that as you look at the data is the difference in gender. So out of the 34 students that were suspended, 30 were um, males and four females. 
half of the 34 students who were suspended were on IEPs. If you look at the racial breakdown of the 34 students that were suspended, um, 23 students identified as white, which would mean about 68% of the students who were suspended were white. Our, last year, our white population was 74%. Four students who identified as African American are 12% of the students who were suspended. Last year, our African American population was a little bit over 3%. Three students who were suspended identified as Asian, or 9% of the students who were suspended. Last year, our Asian population was 11%. Three students identified as multi-race, non-Hispanic. Um, so 9% of the students that we suspended fell in that category. Last year, our multi-race non-Hispanic population was 6%. We didn't have any Hispanic or people who identified as Hispanic who were suspended. Last year, our Hispanic population, of, according to DESI, was 6%. The biggest reason for suspension was an in-school suspension. So we suspended eight students who were caught vaping last year. Seven of those students were only suspended for vaping. There was one student who was also caught vaping and was also suspended for something else. I am hoping that the number of people who are getting, who are vaping are going down in the middle school, um, just from kind of evidence from kids reporting and parents. I think it has gone down. I'm hopeful with some of the new spotlight that has been um, seen both from the governor's office, but also unfortunately through some of the headlines. I think parents are a lot more vigilant with their kids if they are trying to vape and they catch it. I think two or three years ago, we were in the process of educating a lot of our parents of what is a vape, what's a jewel, the pods, and I think parents Parents are a lot more savvy. I also think, unfortunately, because of some of the things that have happened, it's not no longer kind of categorized as, you know, teen rebellion, but I think people are really scared now because of some of the things that are happening. So I'm hoping those numbers go down. We haven't had anyone this year who we have caught with any tobacco or vaping, so I'm crossing my fingers for that. The other thing was just a grade. If you look, we had um, 13 students last year who were suspended were from seventh grade. 21 students were in eighth grade. Um, this year, um, the eighth grade students who are last year's seventh grade students are still getting suspended at a lower rate than their seventh grade counterparts who have moved in. So, so far we have um, suspended 15 students this year. Five have been in the eighth grade and 10 have been in the seventh grade. So I'm finding it's a little less of we suspend a certain grade more. Um, I'm thinking it's just luck of the draw in many, in many respects. Um, we are, this year, out of the 15 kids we have suspended, only two of them have been out of school suspended. We're really trying to keep kids in. If they do, um, you know, make a poor decision, we are trying to keep them in. We are trying to educate them within the school day. The only times that we're really having to use out of school suspension is when we feel that that person's presence would be a disruption at our school. Um, so we're trying our, our best to hopefully have kids learn through consequences, but keep them educated so they don't fall um, further behind. So this year's, uh, or last year's discipline data and today's report is some good news and some bad news. Um, and uh, the, the sort of way in which we sort of do the analysis is we've put a lot of effort over the last six years in reducing number of suspensions and we're addressing students with challenging behavior. Um, and this year we're now in our third year of rolling out an approach called collaborative problem solving, which I'm not going to talk a ton about today. I'd love to come back and talk to you about it some other time. That's the poster that fell down, was just sort of a little visual aid so I could gesture at it at some point during this talk. 
Um, but we've also done work around cultural competency with students and staff, around social emotional learning. We've had a focus on wellness with events and activities, focus on inclusion. We've had programming for students like Voices United. Uh, we've done a lot of great work in terms of developing um, student leadership. We now have a very active Black Student Union, um, Gender and Sexuality Alliance, Young Feminist Organization, and the Student Council. The mission is around inclusion and uh, positive focus. And obviously we have a lot of work around having appropriate programming for academic support, because when kids are succeeding in school, they have a lot less challenging behavior. So that's kind of where we are. We've seen over um, the last three years, which I focus on a lot, which has been the period of the implementation of collaborative problem solving, three trends which really have seemed to impact the disciplinary behavior that we see. One of them, and it's pretty major, is the legalization of marijuana and the um, advent of vaping. Um, I have some positive sense of what uh, Brian is saying, but I also have some real concerns still. Um, the political situation in the country, which I think has led to a lot more provocative behavior, um, an increase in mental health challenges, also nationally and in the school. And honestly, one of the things that in the past I think was leading to uh, a brief period of higher levels of suspension and disciplinary consequences, what I would call better policing, which is just a lot more supervision in the school in an effort to keep the environment safe. You also catch more kids doing things. Um, I think that's turned out now to a, a pretty positive uh, effort. So if you look over the uh, Arlington High School suspension <coughs> trends in terms of the number of out-of-school suspensions over the last uh, six years and this year, the pattern has been um, the year before I came, there were 96 suspensions out of school. We then really started an effort on not using discipline in that way unless we absolutely had to in terms of what behavior students were suspended for school for. And they really are, again, only really disruptive behavior, drugs, theft, fighting, um, vandalism, threats, bullying, things that in large ways are sort of illegal behaviors if you're not in school. Um, and the pattern after that was 56, 53, 76, 47, and this year 34. So over the, or last year. So over the last, over this past three year period during the implementation of collaborative problem solving, we've had a 55% decrease in disciplinary incidents. Um, and that's, that's really good news. Um, if you look at the pattern of that behavior, just looking over this year and last year, there's some even better news as far as I'm concerned and some bad news. Um, so last year, those 34 suspensions were 31 students total. So we're just talking about the students experiencing challenge behavior at that level. Um, we had 18 that were substance. Almost all of those were marijuana or THC, vaped THC. Nine that were what I would refer to as conflict, one of which was with a staff member. Six, which were disruption, things like theft, or um, not sort of student on student, just somebody doing something out there. And one, what I would call chronic, which is kind of a rare case of someone who just kept doing low level things and we finally decided we had to do what we call plan A, which is you had to bring the hammer down. Um, if you go back to the year before that, where we had 42 total students, you'd see that 12 of those were substance incidents. And so the substance incidence continues to be high and has risen in the last two years. It continues to rise this year. Um, 16 were for conflict and three of those were with staff. 16 were for disruption. One was for a chronic incident and one was for a student who committed a felony outside of school. Um, and so the really good news to me, if you think about what collaborative problem solving about, and collaborative <coughs> problem solving is about having a philosophy that kids succeed if they can. And so the approach in terms of dealing with challenging behaviors is to understand that what you're largely dealing with is a lagging skills in these cognitive skills for dealing with challenging behaviors. And so you want to focus on skill, not will. Discipline like putting kids out of school is to keep the building safe, to make it clear to everybody else that that behavior is not acceptable in the building. And we also try to use it to encourage the parents and the students to sort of seek outside support beyond what it is we can provide. But it doesn't teach a kid how to behave if they can't manage their behavior. <coughs> teach them how to behave. In fact, as we know, the other outcome of, dis uh, of discipline through suspension <coughs> is it harms the relationship with the kid <coughs> and puts them further behind in school. So we really try very hard not to use it. So if you look again at that focus, we went from 32 um, suspensions two years ago around issues which would be conflict-based, 
disruptions and conflict, sort of misbehavior that's directed at other people, to only 15 last year. We cut that by more than half. And if you dig down underneath that when you look at conflict with staff, which is something we really want to worry about, right? If we talk about implicit bias and issues around how we deal with students around equity, one of the sort of surmises is that it's about the relationship with a staff member. There were only three of those two years ago. There was only one last year. All three of those two years ago were with students of color. And all three of those involved escalations from an initial behavior. And so that's the sort of thing we really don't want to happen, right? Because that's something within our control. A student may misbehave. We know that they're going to get the same consequences from the misbehavior. But when we interact with a student, if we have the training and the relationship, more often than not, we're going to do a better job of de-escalating that. The one incident with a staff member last year was not escalated by a staff member and did not involve a student of color. And so although that's a very small snapshot because the numbers are small, that, that in terms of data that we're looking at is something that is very positive to me. So jumping ahead, I shared with you all the table of racial disparities for 2018-19. And it's a little hard to read because um, these categories are more fluid than we often talk about. So the good news is, if you look at the racial disparities for this year, um, for African-American students, one, the number overall is just lower. Only 2.3% of students were suspended outside of school. For African-American students, there were only three incidents. But the population is small. In order for there not to be a disparity, there would have had to be only one African-American student suspended outside of school. Um, if you look at other groups that are traditionally over I don't know what the word is, but have disproportionate disciplinary consequences. The other would be Hispanic students. And last year, there were no Hispanic students suspended out of school. But that's a misleading statistic. Because if you then go to the next category, which is other mixed, which is a little bit hard to break out, most of, many of the students in that category that were disciplined identify as, in part, Hispanic. So if you, um, to try to be fair, the question is then how do I add those all together? Um, if you go then to grouping together sort of the groups of students that would be traditionally have inequitable results, so you know, black and brown students, Hispanic, mixed race, and African American, and this is not 100% true, you would see that you had 12 students suspended out of 202 students, which is um, 2.5, two and a half times the general average, which is the same ratio as you saw for African American students. So we still have that disparity. It's significantly lower. If you went back uh, three, four, five years ago, it was five times, four times. Um, and what's happened is the numbers overall have gotten smaller, the ratio has gotten smaller, which is a positive thing. And, and that's what we continue to focus on. You'll also see that one of the patterns, which I didn't calculate out for numbers, is um, that uh, we have a disproportionate number of male students, which is a pattern we see nationally. Right? It's 15 students suspended are male, um, and 18, if I have that right now, it's 20 to 12. So 20 male students and 12, 12 female students. Um, <coughs> so well, that's, that's basically it. All right. Who wants to go first? Ms. Ms. Seuss, go ahead. Uh, so Thank you for this. Um, I'm really glad that we're getting re regular reports. Um, I think that's really valuable um, to look at sort of the whole health of our, our system. Um, I, I'm glad the numbers are going down. I continue to worry about a couple of things. And because there's so many different documents, it's hard to sort of figure out where things are. Um, so one of the things I, I worry about that isn't you guys are numbers that I see at the elementary schools. And I assume those look like they're out of, out of district. I mean, they're. Um, they are not out of district, whatever it's called. They're, they're, they're suspensions, um, out of school suspensions at the elementary school. So it looks like. So there are, oh, which one are you? Go um, so I wasn't looking at that one. One of the documents. Incident count by school. Incident count by school. There's one at Dallin, yep. three at Hardy, yep. one at Stratton. And so, um, you know, we know from lots and lots of research how absolutely devastating out of school suspensions are for students, especially when they're young especially when they're our most vulnerable populations, which this is often because those are the kids who are acting out the most. And so I just want, I'm just concerned about numbers when I see them at the elementary school. Um, so I, 
I, I, I, don't, I don't expect you to talk because about the particular incidents, but I'm just, I, I, I would love for that number to be zero. I mean, at, at the elementary school, how devastating that is early on in they your. Have, they have been zero. There's, I, I really don't want to. Uh, yeah, and you should there, talk about the there, incidents. People okay. take that very seriously and agree with you. Yep. Um, so these are not taken lightly. Yep. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think the question you always have to ask is to what purpose? Or why are we suspending someone? What are we trying to accomplish here? Um, I think too often the answer is, well, we have to create, um, we have to show to the other students, oh, that this, this behavior is unacceptable, and not realizing how devastating it is for that individual student to be out of school at that time. Um, and then the other thing, and I don't know where this is coming from, but when you look at the death report, you get sort of these funny things like, one person was suspended out of school suspension for skipping class, which also feels like that's not quite, you know, that person is disassociated from school and then we throw them out and they're more disassociated from school, right? Um, and then the numbers for disorderly conduct, you know, which is pretty high, it's at 14. And so I just, I worry about those numbers and I just sort of, you know, I'm, I'm glad you're paying attention on it, but I'm just, this is, this is a worry. Yes. Yeah, so, I mean, so first, I agree, right? I mean, that's the bottom line. Suspending kids, I mean, one of the whole points of collaborative problem solving, and I'll, you're just going to get me on my rant here because I have my notes. Um, like, if you think about the philosophy, right, which is the kids succeed if they can, mm -hmm. versus what traditional discipline is used to do, right, which yeah. is to say, let's make them want to, yeah. right? Um, and the problem with that is that, um, when you make them want to, the result is externalized motivation, mm -hmm. breaking that relationship. It doesn't actually teach them the skills, right? And the, mm -hmm. so the, you know, incentives and consequences as a motivator, mm -hmm. right? They teach basic lessons and they provide external motivation. They don't teach complex thinking skills. And so, like, one thing I think to be clear is when you see those things, they're not being used as a motivator, mm -hmm. right? We're not trying to make you not do that because you know, you know you're going to get in trouble right. because for the most part, those be, that's not the point of the behavior. Um, sometimes they're, you know, what they're used for is um, because some rules are rules, right? And also then they become a launching point for a larger conversation. So just for example, because drugs is the big issue. We've already had 16 suspensions this year. When I come back next year, the news, if that trend continues, is not going to be as good as it was this year. Almost all of those are drug related. We hold a 37-H, an expulsion hearing, for every single incident of drug possession in the school. Mm -hmm. Not for being high in school, because the law doesn't do that, but for drug possession. Um, we'll cover this so the kids don't know, but if you, it's a single drug possession if it's not dealing, if it's not something more substantial than that. The purpose of that is to engage the student and the family in conversation, mm -hmm. to bring them back on conditions, to make sure that they're getting into treatment, and to have, to, to sort of put them into a structure which is really our own version of diversion. Right. We don't hold the expulsion hearing in order to put kids into disciplinary situations. Um, and so, uh, I mean, you know, it, it is really important how we do it. And one of the hard things about the DESI stuff, part of why I actually, my numbers that I give you that I report back are from me pulling the stuff up and going through those cases and coding them myself, because you just get weird things in the DESI data. You know, we've had incidents where I know two, you know, where it's just like there are two kids in a category there's one in there where it said there were 11 kids who had an incident, 13 of them were suspended, mm -hmm. right? Because they pull from different lines and they add them up in weird ways and I wanna know what the numbers really mean. Um, yeah, so. Yeah. so. So just, I mean, the disorderly conduct. So skipping school, nobody gets suspended from the high school for skipping school. Well, one person did last year. <laughs> yes, and so remember when I said chronic, right? right? So what ends up happening is that's the code that I went see. in for the I incident. Right that happened to be the last straw of a very long right. period of intervention. Right, and then just, and I know you know this, but, but like things like disorderly conduct, I, I, I know you know this, but you know, African American students with the same behavior as a white student are perceived by teachers often as more disorderly, and so you always have to sort of be careful about that and think about what's really going on. So again, one of the things that we look really hard to make sure, and we actually have a chart, we track this during the year, um, is to make sure that students are having consequences for the same behavior right. and that we're not over-policing. 
Um, and it's a real conversation. Like we just recently were having a conversation where some teachers were complaining about kids that were being loud, you know, and um, it turned out the, the you know, dean went down. They were arguing about Star Trek, um, you know, and so it was like probably not behavior I'm super worried about, but it was perceived because of the nature of who the kids were and where the kids were that that was disruptive behavior. And for me, and this is the issue with collaborative problem solving, like what we're really trying to train everybody to do is that when a kid, wa kid walks in late and says, yo, teach, I don't know who that kid is, I don't know what color that kid is, but that kid walks in and does it. If the response to that is, John, why are you so respectful, disrespectful every time you come in? And if your perception is that's disrespectful differently depending on who the kid is, you're gonna have a pattern of behavior where you don't really get good support. And if instead the conversation is, you know, hey Eric, you know, you're late sometimes, and like the beginning of class, can we talk about that? And then you listen to the kid and have the conversation, that's the way you interrupt those sort of cycles of bias and build the relationships. I also don't know if the disorderly conduct, so you have a, a menu of things that you can choose from, so I don't know if that's a high school or middle school thing, um, but a lot of times that's the, when you're trying to decide between a couple categories, that sometimes is the default that you would put in there as well. So if you had a kid who flipped the desk and yelled at a teacher and whatever, and you're gonna in school the next day, usually it's, disorderly conduct. It also seems to be something that when you don't have something that accurately depicts on the menu, a lot of times you default to calling it disorderly conduct because you have to call it something. Do we have a disorderly conduct for the high school? Please. I don't know. There's 14. There were out of school suspensions last year yeah. for disorderly conduct according to the DESE numbers. Dr. Allison Anthony? I also have a question about the DESE numbers. Just It has bullying. It has one incident with one out of school suspension and that just seems low given the other data that we have that people are experiencing bullying and stuff and I don't know if that's because of what you say that you know it, it's the weirdness of this report or the coding or if it's because the bullying is treated in different ways and so it doesn't even show up I mean if someone's caught bullying another student, it's treated in a different way and it doesn't show up here at all. Um, it just stands out compared to all these other numbers that just one seems low. So at the high school, we've logged one case of bullying as a suspension. So the law and practice right around bullying is when, I mean, for one thing, Many incidences of bullying are incidents of conflict, right? Um, I mean, the language of bullying is specific and legal, right? And it involves repeated behavior in a hostile environment with a power differential. Um, whenever there's a complaint about bullying, we do an investigation. We make a determination of whether it's bullying or something else. Often it's something else, but the something else is still not okay. And those students may end up on behavior plans. They may have interventions. Um, but for the most part, they do not escalate to the point of ending up as a, as a suspension out of school. Because that would have to be pretty much, you know, you were told not to do this. We were really clear you did it. It was differential, and you continued to do it. Um, and most of the time, it's resolved with more restorative justice, more behavior, more conversations and mediation. Okay. Yeah, I'd say that's accurate as well. We can't say that, you know, there was one bullying case 6 through 12 last year, but I think a lot of times we're able to hopefully curb that before it does become an out-of-school suspension. So there's a process that we follow, procedures that we follow, including calling in parents, doing paperwork if people are on an IEP, reconvening a team. There's a lot of things that we do it hopefully doesn't escalate to where an incident happens that all of a sudden we're like, we warned you, we've been through this, you're now out of school. Um, a lot of times something might happen along the way and a kid might be, it might be the second offense that something happens and you might be dealing with that specific event and then you're meeting with the parties involved and saying like that is the second thing we're considering that's bullying if you do something else then 
we're involving, you could involve the police, you could have another out of school suspension. But I think a lot of times, as Dr. Zhang said, there's not something usually that says, we've met, your parents have been in, you've continued to do it, now you're suspended. And so I think we're not claiming there's one bullying case, but we're saying that hopefully we've addressed the bullying earlier before it had to become an out-of-school suspension. So, and that might be an in-school suspension, that might be detentions, that might be some restorative justice piece that has happened before it's risen to that level. Okay. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Schickman. Uh, the vaping thing has me worried. Uh, and I know that in Lowell we're seeing uh, a boatload of uh, suspensions for vaping. Is there, uh, I'm, I'm at a loss to figure out what we can do to look at this differently so that we're not tossing kids out of school and they're not vaping. How, what kind of interventions are we able to establish that might allow the kids to retain in school and why is it, I, I, you know, I guess, you know, this is a violation of policy uh, to be in possession of vaping equipment within the building. Uh, but how do we also identify this as being a, uh, an addiction issue that, that we're addressing? I think, it, I think it looks, and I'm not sure if Matthew would agree with me or not, but I think it looks different in the middle school than it probably does in the high school. Mm -hmm. So I think in the, in the middle school last year we caught eight kids who were vaping, more kids than that obviously were vaping mm -hmm. that we didn't catch. Um, I think a lot of it is experiment, experimenting, you know, kind of first, you know, a seventh grader, or, or last year it was mostly all eighth graders that we caught. Um, I think at the high school, it's, there, it's probably a little less tobacco that you might be worried about. With, it's mm -hmm. both. Um, none of the things that we caught were drug related mm -hmm. with vaping last year. Um, my sense is, and my hope is, as I've said, is that at the middle school level, 13 and 14 year olds, it's harder to come by right now. And it's also, um, we haven't got the reports from parents, we haven't got the reports from kids that it is as bad as it was last year. Um, you know, when we do have someone who vapes, our first call is to Cindy Curran, who talks and kids have to do, um, they have to either go through a diversion program or they have to pay a fine. We keep them in school so they're not out of school, um, you know, because we want to keep them there and keep them educated. And part of what they're doing is the diversion program that is being set up. So if you're suspending, it's probably a repeat? We didn't suspend anyone out of school for uh -huh. vaping, um, and we didn't have anyone that we caught as a second offense for vaping. It was the first time last year that we would catch someone vaping that we'd have an in-school suspension. We'd call Cindy Curran. Cindy Curran would get in contact with the Arlington Health. They would come in. There'd be a diversion program, things that they would have to do so that they wouldn't get fined. Um, but we don't... You know, I don't feel for tobacco and, and vaping that we needed those kids outside of school. We wanted to keep them there, but also have a chance to talk to people and to hopefully do their work. Mm -hmm. So first, just to make a distinction, we talk about vaping. There's juuling, vaping, nicotine cartridges. Mm -hmm. um, and then there's vaping THC. Mm -hmm. Um, and the little cartridges of THC that are about this big sell for about 25 bucks, and they have 25 joints in them um, at 90 plus percent THC. They are very powerful. You take one hit of that thing, and it's like you just smoked a joint, right? So it's a very different thing in terms of people's understanding about THC. Um, at the high school, our response to vaping of nicotine is similar to that at the middle school. It's a tobacco violation. It's a drug paraphernalia violation. It's an MIA violation, so students will miss ac um, athletics if they get caught, and that's probably one of the strongest motivators. Um, the students will be searched, and this is part of the issue there. Um, and then they get diversion, they get a motivational interview, 
Um, they work with Cindy and they get a fine, which actually goes to the parents if they don't participate in the program. Um, the issue for us last year was out of control. Kids were coming to us complaining about kids in the bathrooms, like that you couldn't go to the bathroom um, because you were walking through kids. Teachers were just sort of opening the door of the bathroom saying, all five of you, come on down, and they were bringing them on down. Those drug, and, and many of those drug offenses were teachers with six kids in the bathroom bringing them all down, and we searched them, and then they'd end up with THC in their bags. So that was last year. It feels this year, and I have no data on this, other than sort of how people were reporting incidents, that with sort of issues around vaping and lung disease and parents finally saying, no, this isn't just a cute thing, it's a big deal, that we've fewer of the just kind of a group of kids going in to take a hit on somebody else's vape before they go off to class because it's funny and it's social. And it's really sort of a more surreptitious or more involved group of kids. But uh, the vaping of THC is seen by a lot of kids as normal, it's safer than smoking, it's safer than drinking. If you look on the YRBS, you saw drinking went down, offset by, uh, by an increase in THC. The number of kids who are sort of seriously using substances remain probably the same, but a lot more of this was THC. And what we're really finding concerning this fall, and, and I, I'm, you know, I've talked to a lot of public health folks about this, is that if you think about the combination, because this is what's happening, of vaped nicotine and vaped THC. Mm -hmm. Vaped nicotine is way more addictive than cigarettes, and cigarettes are way more addictive than marijuana. Mm -hmm. But vaped THC is much more habit-forming. Kids, we have the experience now of kids who vaped THC, and like they don't remember when we caught them. Right? because you can take so much THC in such a short period of time mm -hmm. that they are really substantially affected. We have reports from people, you're not in our school, but if, you know, elsewhere else, nobody went to emergency rooms from smoking joints. Mm -hmm. It would take like a month to get it all into you, but they are now going to emergency room from vaping THC. So it's really concerning behavior. And we are seeing what appears to be just more aggressive, more sort of drug-seeking behavior and more kind of a group. And it's not, the nice thing about you know a school is we say these things with fear because there's 16, you know, 15 cases in a small period of time. There's a group of kids we're worried about. It's a school of 50, you know, 1,415 kids, and the vast majority of kids aren't doing this and don't want to have anything to do with this. Um, and the main inconvenience for them is that they can't find a bathroom they want to go to. Um, and that's a real issue, but it's the nature of the building. But the other issue is a big one. So just today... The main speaker at the event was about jeweling and about the effects on people's lungs and what's going on. The second one of the other presentations was about drug addiction and sort of the sequence of drug addiction. Um, we're working on public information. We have meetings with the kids. We're going to be having class meetings coming up in January. Um, and I know uh, is Cindy still here. Um, you know, the C Cindy runs and we're, with the um, Arlington Youth Health and Safety Federation. A lot of parent forums to try to get the information out to parents. I actually think, I mean, for us in the high school, it's going to be about building relationships and getting the kids who are currently already in trouble. For folks coming up for the middle school, it's like trying to get cigarettes out of the, bat all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and it's going to be about changing the attitudes of parents to be able to realize that, like, it's, it's much more, it's, it's much more worrying behavior, it's much more destructive behavior than, you know, um, sort of an occasional this it's not really a big deal thing, and that's something that's just going to have to change norms again. All right. Uh, real quick, real quick. This is something that I think we have a lot on our table right now as educators and, and the stuff, but this is a new thing. This is a new scourge that's coming through. It, during the 50s and 60s and 70s, we brought into education alcohol. We brought into drugs in the 70s and the 80s and stuff. We dealt with it. This is a brand new thing. We're going to have to add this to the curriculum and all aspects of it on through all history. It's not going to happen overnight. Just want to share that. All right. Well, I think we need to move on. Any last questions? All right. Great. Thank you for Thank you. Thank coming you and guys. presenting this. One, one of the things that's in my superintendent's report is about today's wellness. I don't know if you'd like to have Dr. Jenger just talk a little bit. Sure. Grab, grab him before he goes. Dr. Jenger. 
One last thing. Well, <laughs> he already, he, no, no, no. He, he knows that I was going to ask him. Um, today we had the wellness day from 9 to 11, and it was, from all I've heard, very successful. Um, they, the, it was so well organized. You've seen the website that they created for each grade level. Um, and all the students had, as you talked about, this, this one assembly on jeweling. But I'll let you talk about it because it was really a very successful day. So Wellness Day, I think, is really the 12th year of what we've called in the past Mental Health Awareness Day. Um, Andrea Razi deserves huge credit for bringing that to the school many years ago and keeping it going and being a champion. Um, the model that we've been experimenting with the past few years has been a conference model. And part of the idea behind having it be a conference model is we're able to bring in lots of different speakers. We're allowed to able to have students do workshops, teachers do workshops. Um, and the reason for that is because one of the things we often say about these, you know, workshop days or inclusion day, which I'll talk about in a second, is that we act as if, you know, people then say, well, yeah, so one day a week we care about, one day of the year we care about wellness. But the purpose of this is to get that information into the community and also to build capacity. So all the folks that are running these workshops are also then often then running those other activities and it ends up spur spurring other activities through the year. And so um, Andrea Razi is the organizer, the primary organizer, and then Stacy Kitsis does the scheduling. She's our librarian. Um, and uh, with work from our, help from our computer science students, um, and Dan Sheldon, our computer science teacher. They've actually created a whole scheduling program that ranks what kids want um, and shoots them all emails of what, what their schedule is, and so students are doing workshops. We had therapy dogs in the building. We had a speaker about jeweling, who is uh, Dr. Hartman, who was recommended to us by the Middlesex Partners for Youth. Um, and then we had, for half the school, the students went to something called the Improbable Players, which is a group that does work around wellness and. Uh, drug addiction and stress, um, and they had come last year and were very popular, so we decided to put them in front of more people, and then half the school did a whole bunch of wellness activities, um, and so we experiment with that every year, and then in the spring, um, we'll be doing Inclusion Day, the second, uh, this is the third or fourth, I can't, the fourth uh, Inclusion Day, which is the same basic structure, but it's around diversity, equity, and inclusion with student, teacher, and expert-run workshops. Um, it's really a, it's a fun day. It's really great. Thanks for reminding me. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Now we are really moving on. Um, mm -hmm. So next item is the school calendar uh, first read. I had actually intended this really to just be a discussion and a vote next week on the first day of school. So it's helpful to have the calendar there because it shows what the impact of the first day of school is barring no other changes, but there's still a calendar committee that is still looking at possibly making other changes. Not so, the first day yet. Um, so my intention is to next week just have a vote on what the first day of school for students will be, um, unless anybody else wants to proceed differently. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, other updates? I, I, I think that's accurate. The, the thing that I think that we could also vote on, because they're, they're pretty much standard, is when the vacations are. It's always mm -hmm. in February and April, the third full week of the month. Um, and so that can vary every year as to where it is, because some people want to start planning vacations um, so that they can see, you know, to see where we are. If you look at December next year, because of leap year, Chris, Christmas is on a Wednesday this year, and next year it will move to a Friday. And so the proposal on this calendar is something you might want to, you can think about, whether uh, we'll have those three days, and then um, we'll come back to school on Monday the 4th. So it's sort of reversing it. This week we have a week off during the, the, the federal Christmas holiday, and then we come back halfway through the following week. But um, otherwise, the other thing that will definitely be set for next year, too, is when we have the professional day, when we have a major election, and next year we'll qualify in that category, um, we agree to not hold school, have children come to school because most of the uh, uh, the voting takes place in the elementary schools. 
So we already know which day will be our professional development day. So those are the key things we definitely know. And um, we will, this isn't, the, this is the first pass at the calendar. It's earlier than we've done it in the past. We've usually done the first pass in January. Um, but we will try to get, certainly by the springtime, have more, a better idea of exactly when the early releases will be uh, for the middle school, for conferences, and, and all of that. But we don't have that yet. So next week we'd vote to, for the vacations, and the very first day of school is September 8th. Mm -hmm. I think so, yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Great. All right. Uh, approval of superintendent's goals. Um, Jane, is there anything you want to say that we had reviewed them? This is we already done the first read of those, mm -hmm. right? I don't think so. I think the only thing that's added um, is what we're going to be using for evidence, which mm -hmm. we didn't approve um, as part of the goal package last year, but I think it makes sense um, to do so for next year. Mm -hmm. Right. We did do that before you joined two years right, ago. Right, we did. So. Yeah. I have a very short institutional no, before you, before you joined, it was before knowledge, you joined. So, which I'm fine with. Yes, Mr. Hayner? I just need a little clarification. I may be reading this wrong. Under the uh, superintendent's achievement goal, I'm reading this that basically says what is going to be tested. I'm not seeing anything uh, dealing with improving the student. If we identify a student's need, does that come under, I didn't see it under evidence, so, I mean. Well, the, as we talked about earlier, the, the long time, the long term multi-year goal is to have all of our students at reading benchmark by the end of third grade. I understand that, but yeah. it's not. And, the t the, and what we will use for a measurement on that is MCAS, which is what we have been looking at. But as I read this goal here, mm -hmm. it's dealing with the uh, assessment not with uh, taking that, uh, the, any of the data from the assessment and working with it. Am I, I'll stand corrected. Am I reading this wrong, or is this how it's presented? Um, what I was, I mean, how you interpret it is, is um, perhaps, I'm not quite sure. What I'm looking at are what are the things that we are doing in the district. You heard many of them this evening. Yes. That we're doing to try to uh, move the needle on our proficiency. This last year, actually, we've been looking at reading for more. This isn't just this I'm year. Not, I'm not questioning that. I, and I did hear that tonight. Yeah. The only thing I see under the goal is number four under key actions, which says all teachers will teach the teacher's college nonfiction unit. But I don't see any in the goal itself. I don't see anything that's measurable beyond the assessing. Well, the the I'm reading it wrong. I'll, I'll stand corrected. No, that was. I mean, that was discussed by your subcommittee, right? I mean, right. I, I'm not. This is what was settled on. I'm not trying That's to right. measure the actions. What the ultimate measure is, what is happening with our proficiency. Just to be clear, the goal is to do the testing. Yes. And assessing. For this year. For this year. Thank you. Okay. So, do we need a motion to approve? The yes. Goal? So I move that we approve the superintendent's goals for. FY for FY 20. And standards of evidence. And stand, yes. Uh, second. second. Oh. Did that include the evidence part? Yes, he, yes. Just, yes. he, just, he just amended. Standards of evidence, yes. Yes. <coughs> purpose to discuss it? Sure. Oh, yes. mm -hmm. Last year's evidence uh, it was suggested that a, not only a log be kept of communication, but uh, an, uh, in general, uh, a summation of what transpired that did not come forward for the uh, the evidence when it was presented for the superintendent. Are we not going to have any? I'm just asking again for clarification. We're not going to have any uh, specifics with regard to meetings and things of that nature. Can I ask? At the, Go ahead. So the for the individual schools. So she didn't. She doesn't have the same goal. Okay for that. Mm -mm. So that was under, it was under instructional leadership for last year. Um, and so that goal has been 
changed, so that evidence would no longer be relevant. Thank you. It's a different goal. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed? No. Any abstentions? All right. Uh, the next item uh, was a request from, a repeat request from uh, the, I forget who it's from, but it's There's related questions. to the uh, Jason Russell House and their CPA application. Um, my own view on this is I think probably all of the CPA applications are going to be things that are, a lot of them are going to be things that are related to education in town. In this case, it, it is a place that we take our students to field trips, and we did vote before to support it, so uh, happy to, to do it again. Um, but it does sort of set a precedent that, you know, any other group, you know, doing a playground, doing a, a field, doing, you know, another historic resource source coming to us for support. I don't know if that's a, the business we want to get into, but... This one, this one makes sense. Mr. Hayner? I, I agree with what you say, but at the same time, this deals with the history of the community, All right, and right, yeah. it, it's a direct curriculum aspect, mm -hmm. so I think it's a little bit more. Okay. And mm -hmm. therefore, I, I move that uh, we direct this, uh, that yes. the chair to a uh, letter of support. Thank you. Second. Second. Is there any further discussion? Yes. I, I just have a question. Um, are we just signing our name to a letter, or have we seen it's the letter? You. It's the same letter Jeff did two years ago. Okay. <laughs> same letter. Just as we support. Okay, so there's yeah. nothing in the great detail. Okay, no. that's what I want to know. All right. All right. He hit save as and change. <laughs> it, it you Karen updated it. Change the date. Karen updated it. Change the date and the signature line. It's a good idea. added a couple things. Great. All right, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Yes. Any opposed or abstentions? Great, thank you. All right, superintendent's report. All right, I have a few things, and the first thing I wanna uh, start with um, is the high school building project. Um, tomorrow we will be sending out a letter, I will be sending a letter to uh, parents in the community as well as we'll have an announcement about where we are and update on the high school project. Um, we've been meeting quite a bit uh, as we look at um, all of the all aspects of the project in terms to value engineer what that means is getting the same you know getting the same function but perhaps with a um, a lesser cost and we've been in that engaged in that activity pretty much all fall which is a, um, a, a definitely a part of the MBA MSBA process um, during this time we have had more detail that has been uh, coming on the cost of various parts of the project. And uh, at, we've just recently had asked the project team, which consists of our designer, the architects, um, our owner's project manager, and then the, the contractor, to g look at the cost estimates and to see if um, they can bring what was a gap between the budget that's been approved at, by the community of 290.8 $290 million dollars. Uh, that is the budget that we're going to work with, but as we've gone through this process of actually having more uh, clearer um, design numbers, um, the estimate has exceeded the budget, and so we've been going through the process of having to um, bring the design and the uh, cost of the project to the budget and so we're engaged currently in that process but we felt um, as a building committee that the community should be aware of this and you know what are the types of things that we are considering and what is our criteria for how to make those judgments and the, of course the first <coughs> the first criteria which is number one for sure is the educational program and, and functionality of the building that is something that all of this gets filtered through, as well as the building quality, and then sustainability. Um, one of the goals that we had for this project is net zero, meaning that we were able to have a match between the energy generated and the energy used. Um, so the, the, these commitments remain in, remain in place as we go through this process. 
And there are some large decisions that we're going to need to make. And one of the other filters of sort of thinking this through is there are some things that you um, can't change later, you can't add later mm -hmm. as you get bids in. And so those could be the things that we choose to do later. And so in order to bring the, the, bu the budget completely in line with the design. Um, and, and so one of the things is, is just the number of geothermal wells that we would have. The commitment is still to an all electric building so that we are not Fossil, using fossil fuels as we go forward. And you know what would be, we've looked at a deep analysis of what would be the effect of reducing the number of geothermal to another number. So that's something that the, the building committee is thinking about. There are um, other major considerations as well. Uh, one might be, um, uh, other large items might be lighting and artificial turf of the athletic fields. This is something that you can decide on later, um, but there's a lot, a lot of discussion that's going on about that in terms of uh, the prog program. The bike path connection that we've talked about, again, that could be added later. The one that is a large item, which is the, um, the <coughs> ramp on the east side of the building, which is the CVS side, uh, that would have to be, that's a big thing <coughs> now because that's not something that can be added later. It has to be a phase one decision. But there are other issues as well that we're going through and balancing off. We went through a very long, two long meetings this week, doing a real look at each one of these items. And next Tuesday, yeah, next Tuesday we're meeting to again look at how we're going to come to consensus, um, if not consensus, at least majority on, on you know what we um, will have to reduce or wait till later to get the, um, the design and costs in line with the budget. And the thing that's really important to know is it, everybody's taking very, very seriously and very committed to making sure that we have an excellent facility that meets all of our programmatic needs. And we want to make sure that we, uh, we remain a carbon <coughs> neutral building going forward. So it's, it, these are, these are really um, tough decisions, and we wanted the people to know about this and not know about it after the fact. Mm -hmm. um, and, and our meeting is, uh, again, next Tuesday and possibly also next Wednesday. We've been meeting a lot. There's been a lot of subcommittee meetings um, with our architects and, and contractor to really understand the, the impact um, of any decision. So I think I've pretty much got the full picture, but you might want to add a few other things because Dr. Allison Ampey is on it, and of course, Mr. Thielman chairs the committee. I, I just wanted to clarify that as we discuss the reducing the number of geothermal wells, part of the reason that that is under strong consideration is that we are finding that we're able to meet the same sustainability goals even with the reduced number of geothermal wells through alternate, it's called VFR, and I don't, I can't tell you what the mnemonic stands for, but um, the point is that we are able to still meet our goals, so. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. No, I, mean, I just think I, it's important for people to know that committees work really hard, put in a lot of time, a lot of hours, a lot of meetings, a lot of subcommittee meetings, and I think we've come to a very good place Tuesday and possibly Wednesday night, we have like the final couple of decisions to make and we'll take votes and we'll see where they go. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is a process that will continue through the whole project right. actually. Um, we're hoping that we are very successful in our bidding process and that we you know, have some positives that come to make some costs not so expensive and, and we don't know what that will be until we actually get our first package out which some of it will be actually out, uh, you know, probably in January, February, because we're going to be beginning the yep. work for pre-construction starting um, after a February vacation, actually probably during it. Some bids are going out as we speak. Yeah, Very some good. bids will be yeah. going out. We have to get, we have to decide. So, yeah, I mean, even though, I mean, we're, we're still staying on our timeline mm -hmm. for construction that hasn't mm -hmm. changed. We looked at a lot of different options, including trying to, collapse some of the, uh, you know, uh, phases yep. that 
was hard to do. Um, <clears throat> we, uh, you know, we're we're in a we're in an environment where prices go up. But I, you know, when you look at other projects around the state, because I work a little bit in different you know in different uh, places from my day job, and I meet other people involved in building projects, it's not unusual for a building project this size to be in a, in this situation. We have to make uh, reductions. So. I was talking to um, a school committee member in Brookline. Right. And they're dealing with this, that, that um, when you get these really big projects that are really complicated, and theirs is very complicated all to, for another reason, that <coughs> they're seeing a 10% change just from the last six months in terms of there's, there's fewer um, subcontractors that can do projects this big and this complex, and so it's the market demand. And there are more projects coming online. Belmont's already outbidding. Waltham will be behind us. Belmont or Brookline is, so there are quite a few. And um, there's only so many subcontractors to go around for these really big projects. And we're learning a lot, like, you know, Kathy, Michael, Tristan, and I know all about chill beams, things like that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and Mike, yeah, Mike is, is on yeah, this so too. Yeah. Yes. yeah, I mean, you know, you know, who knows? We could come up at a cocktail party and we'd fit right in. <laughs> yeah, we, we, we are learning a lot. Yeah. That is very true, yeah. very true. But anyway, uh, I, it's important for, the, the, for all of you to know, and some of you have been attending the meetings, which is terrific. Um, and I think you can see the very thoughtful discussions that are, that are going on about all this. Uh, you know, I'll say that the, you know, um, what, the, what the design team has said, and maybe they say this to all their customers, I don't know, but they've said that we have a very, um, you know, our meetings are not big battles with, you know, chairs being thrown and people yelling and they've seen that in other districts number one number two there are people on the there are yeah there are there are people on the committee with a lot of expertise and we have a, we have people with who you know John Cole ran a big uh, architectural firm in the in the in the region um, you know lots of people have a lot of expertise in this field so Ryan Katowski can run circles around anybody when it comes to uh, HVAC stuff so Kate Lucian has Kate Lucian has a background right <laughs> That's, you know, she does this sort. She of does this sort of work all day long. Yeah. Frank Callahan is in the building trades and really asks some unbelievably good questions about mm -hmm. you know, yes. things. Yes, nice. right. So this it's is a, a very, smart group of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are impressed. Mm -hmm. And thank you for your leadership, Bonnie. You really get us through the, well, all this. Well, they put the guy with the least amount of intelligence in the chair role. That way, it's, like, it's mm. easy. Yeah. <laughs> the least amount of knowledge of all that stuff. Yeah. Um, I also wanted, we're going to send this out very soon, to save the date, um, and I want to thank AEF for making this possible. We're going to have a learning summit for parents, families, and the community on uh, basically wh what our SEL um, program is like in, the, in our schools, and it's going to be on Saturday, May 2nd, and we will send that date out just to keep reminding people about that. Um, and then the last thing is about snow. I, I sent the letter out. But, uh, you know, the forecast is we're going to have some really potential very snowy days. And um, I just want people to understand the kind of thinking that goes into this and when it starts. It starts very early in the morning. Our director of transportation is driving around Arlington at 3 in the morning. And our, cust our, our head custodian is as well, and we're in communication. And with DPW, they're talking to DPW. So it's a very, it's, it's a very um, team approach to this. Beca and, the, and the thing that's at, at the heart of it is safety. On the other hand, we're, and not on the other hand, but we also live in <coughs> a very, we're living in a winter. And New England is winter, and so when, when do you make that decision that it's it's not going to um, be safe for students and staff? And that last Tuesday was an example of that we became it became very clear not initially but later in the evening that the duration was going to go longer than we thought, and it it even went longer than we thought. So. Um, but at the same time, parents need to make a decision themselves. Um, we, we, look at, we look at Arlington, the same thing for staff. We have to look on basis what's going on in Arlington, not outside, out, not, not outside of Arlington as much, in terms of whether we have the walkways you know, cleared and treated and park, 
parking lots? Are the roads clear? <coughs> not every curb, curb cut's gonna be clear. Um, these, these things may not happen, but um, just want everybody to know that it's, very, it's, a, it's a very stressful decision, I must, I must say. But if they think that they're, it's not safe for their child to, to travel to school, then they just need to let the school know this. And we understand. That's it. Great. Thank you. Uh, consent agenda. All items listed below are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant, warrant number 20091, dated 11-19-2019. Total amount 1534464.82. Warrant number 20105, dated 11-26-2019. Total amount 476195.81. Approval of minutes, regular school committee minutes 11-14-2019. And approval of trips, OMS Drama Club, New York City trip, May 16th, 2020. Uh, so we're holding on the minutes and the motion for the rest. So move. Second. All those are in favor? All right. Yes. Any abstentions or, or no's? Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, unanimous. And then the minutes. Was there any discussion or just you I weren't just, there? I need okay. to abstain, that's all. All those present. in fit any dis motion on the minutes, actually? So moved. Second. Any, any discussion? All those in favor? Uh, yes. yes. One abstention. One abstention. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Policies. Mr. Schuckman. Hey, we're, your, we're at policies. It's a beautiful thing. Um, we had a meeting uh, the Monday before Thanksgiving to mop up some things we were discussing previously. Um, the uh, second read, BEA is the second read. Oh. Uh, moving our number from 20 down to 19. Meetings okay. will have yep. to schedule. Yes. And we, once we get the new, we, new calendar adopted, we can sort of look to pencil in our 19 days. Yep. Now going to BEDB, agenda format prep dissem dissemination first reading. Uh, we're getting rid of the bulletin boards of the school and posting our agenda online. Um, there's a provision that used the word citizens in terms of uh, being able to suggest business to the school committee, uh, which is unduly restricted because there are a lot of very good people involved in the community who are not United States citizens <coughs> and want to maintain their um, <clears throat> ability to uh, talk with us. Uh, there's a paragraph we're adding that's emphasizing uh, that this is the only place where we can talk to each other in a deliberative format. Um, and in order to facilitate deliberations and discussions, where we are being talked at, reports and presentations that are directed at us, where we're sitting and listening and not interacting shall not exceed 15 minutes unless the rules are suspended by a two-thirds vote of the members present. Written reports may be received by a vote of the committee. In fact, that's a good thing for us to do for homework so we know what's going on as the meeting starts and entered in the record of the meeting and we expect that they would not be read to us. Uh, and that uh, we're stating that, look, we're, we're a K-12 education. We're one of the best school systems in the, sta in the state and in the nation. We're constantly ranking high, and it would be our expectation of presentations would be consistent with the high standards that we have for teaching and learning throughout the district. Um, <clears throat> there's another paragraph we are adding. Uh, all published agendas shall, shall contain the following language pertaining to accessibility for people with disabilities. This is strongly advised by the uh, Attorney General and correcting the word public participation to public comment in the references. May I? Mr. Chairman, you, it's your meeting. Yeah, let's yeah. go through the, okay. the presentation of the different policies okay. first. Okay, now we're going to B-E. Um, 
again, this, uh, for the most part, we're just bringing this into conformance with open meeting law um, uh, regarding the accessibility. Uh, adjourned meetings were called for in the policy. They are not permitted per se under the open meeting law. If we have a, what we once considered to be an adjourned meeting, it has to be posted as a new meeting with a 48 hour advance notice. Uh, and so we've adjusted the policy for that. And on KF-E fee structure for rental of school building state space, we're essentially just cleaning up the group four to move the parentheses where it would belong and then deleting the paragraph, the schedule of refundable damage deposits, the energy charges, rates, and applications of rental will be reviewed by the business office by March 15th of each year and approved by the school committee. We've, we are looking to delete that paragraph. So that is what we're bringing before you at this point. Okay, Mr. Hainer. Mm -hmm. uh, on BEDB, mm -hmm. the first bullet. Yeah. Um, I think either something has to be put in there with regard to emergency because the 48, you can't change your gender except for emergencies. Um, <coughs> with a disclaimer of the agenda. No, what, what you're saying is that, um, no, I hear what you're saying. Um, in upper, uh, obviously, state law trumps or right. takes priority over what we're writing the policy. I, some way that I, I'm <coughs> grammatically just slipping the word with regard to emergencies, it would still be appropriate. Um, agenda is posted with a disclaimer regarding emergencies that agenda is the agenda is tentative. An emergency, the, the chair can always add anything right up to the last minute, right during the middle of a meeting if something happened. Mm. I leave it to the chair. I mean, I mean, I don't want to get into uh, uh, making edits on the fly. That's the I, only thing. I think I it's, it's, it's a good, uh, good thought and good suggestion. Uh, but yeah, I mean, if you come up with a, a sentence you'd like to substitute, it's second reading. I'll, re I'll bring it. That back. would I'll send certainly be something I, I, I think is more than appropriate. I think. Thank you. Good. All right, any other comment? Yes, Dr. Athanampi. Okay, I'm also commenting on BEDB. Mm -hmm. um, I want to register my uh, disagreement with the 15-minute uh, rule. Um, I feel that it's the wrong, okay, I understand the thought behind it, which is to create a higher level of reports that don't go beyond a certain amount. Um, I think a set time limit is restrictive and to have it be able to be waived by a, by a rule suspended, I mean, only have it be able to be waived by a two thirds vote of members present means that the chair can't just say, okay, I think it's okay to do this. And I, when I brought this up before, it was like um, the response that I got was that, well, I think the chair will, you know, people will probably go along with the chair. But the thing is, people have to know how much time they're going to have to present. Um, I also think that this is putting into policy something that I think is more appropriate as direction for the superintendent with feedback going directly to her or him, whoever superintendent is at this point, um, and ultimate feedback as part of the evaluation process. So I voted against the BEDB as presented here and will vote against it again if it's brought this way to us next week. Thank you. Yeah, my, my view, my take on this was also was similar. There may be some items that we know in advance are going to take 20, 25 minutes as the chair putting the agenda together, 
I want the presenters to be able to know that they're going to have 20 or 25 minutes and not be subject to a vote as to whether they're going to have it or not. So I, I would be willing to have a 15 minute guideline unless, you know, the chair decides otherwise type of language, but um, I wouldn't be able to support it this way either. Is there a further comment? Mr. Thielman? I agree with Kirsty in a way. I think it's, um, I think the, the chair should be given the direction, the discretion, and we should work with the superintendent. We only have, we have a 10 o'clock rule that limits what we can do here anyway, and people get tired after about nine. So I think it's just good judgment on the part of the chair. I mean, I take Paul's point, which is <clears throat> we're here to deliver. Good guideline, talk. yes. Yeah, so I don't, I don't disagree with the point, but I think, to, I think it's too <coughs> descriptive and then it becomes, it has a danger in a future committee, maybe, I don't think it would happen in this one, but in a in past committee I was on, I think it would happen. You would, um, it would get very political in a hurry. I mean, you might not get a two-thirds vote to, you know, let somebody talk longer. Derek, Mr. Shipman? Yeah, I mean, first of all, the intent is that we're not being talked at. Yeah. The agenda item can go 15, 30, 45, 60, two weeks, whatever it is. But that the person who's starting and sitting at the table over there isn't going to be talking at us for more than 15 minutes unless there is a, a, a vote to waive the rule. Now, town meeting operates that way with a seven-minute rule. And the result has been tighter, more focused presentations. And when you have an unlimited amount of time, uh, the, the presentations can just go much longer and be unfocused. The discipline of having to come in within a prescribed time limit will require people to be more thoughtful about what they're bringing to us, to be placing stuff that is best off read by us in a written format, to make PowerPoints, uh, a summary that we're talking off of, and then bringing us to a point where we can be interactive. That's the intent here. And because we end up being a captive audience, we, we've sat here for an hour on, on, on certain presentations where you take a look around the room and, and folks here are disengaged. Uh, and, and that's not a good thing for anybody because you'll have somebody talking at us and we're not being, we're not really listening. And for the folks who are watching on television, the point is if we're looking to convey information to the folks of Arlington, uh, we need to do it in the best manner we can in a, in a tight, disciplined presentation unless the topic is complicated enough that we recognize that we want somebody to talk to us for more than 15 minutes is an important thing. Um, I, I just think that we need to take a little more control over our meetings and to raise the standards for, for, the, uh, uh, for what comes before us. Ms. Seuss? Uh, so I think the key uh, half sentence here is unless the rule is suspended by two-thirds vote of the members present and that that could potentially be changed to unless prior approval of the chair and get at your concern would not get it um, Dr. Mm -hmm. Allison Envy's all of your concerns mm -hmm. um, but it might be mm -hmm. something that would have a broader support mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a friendly amendment or I mean, oh, you know or, or, or it could be worded like a, a two-thirds vote or by prior arrangement with the chair. So if the chair says, I'm giving you 20 minutes and, and it's on the agenda. Yeah, I, I, you sort know. Of, I sort of do agree with the sort of thinking that, um, that the chair should be involved in this decision, that a presenter should know beforehand whether he or she is gonna have 15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, you know, it's, I, that, that's something I could easily support, um, just unless prior mm -hmm. um, approval by the chair or something like that. Yeah, they add a sentence, uh, add a phrase in less. I would take out the two-thirds. I, the, I think that's, that's what I could support. Take out what? Well, well hold on. That's, a, that's a, just a suggestion. I'm not, I, I don't know if I should make a. Why don't, I, why don't we all think about it and come up with uh, something for second read? 
that, yeah. that we might land on. Okay. Yep. Dr. Allison Ampey. I, I just, I realize I forgot one other point that I was going to make, um, which is also, I also wonder how the chair would effectively do, how this rule would work in practice. You know, so we've got to have a timer, and then they're at 15 minutes, time's up, and they're clearly several slides later. Do you, like, beep it? You know, it, it's, I just don't see this working in a way, I mean, as it's written, as a policy, I don't see this working in a way as it is in our benefit or in, our, in the student's benefit. I think it is more, it would be better directed to the superintendent. If you have 17 slides remaining after 15 minutes in which you were talking solo, you do not have a well rehearsed presentation. Ms. Morgan, did you have your hand up? Um, I, I think that the, I would, I would support this as is. I do think the challenge of the exceeding 15 minutes and the suspension of the two-thirds vote is challenging in practice to some extent. At the same time, I have, there's been, I could count on one hand in the 18 months I've been here, presentations that I think warranted much more of the of the presentation part warranted much more than 15 minutes for the level of detail that we need that we can absorb and i would be really grateful for more of an you know more of an executive approach to some of the presentations that we've gotten so i would support this as written but i recognize that it um has some it could have some practical you know, if, if somebody wanted 20 minutes and not 15 minutes, it would be hard to practically give them those five minutes until we got here. Um, so, you know, I would also support um, it being at the discretion of the next, of the, of the chair. Yeah, Mr. Hayner. I think setting up the agenda the way it's been done, I look at the time set on some of 15 minutes, some of 20 minutes, some of 30 minutes. I respect that. The only problem is, the 20 minute one tonight went an hour and different things. Not for naught, Some of the, you know, a lot of it we own because we were asking questions and things of that nature. So the 15 minutes may belong to them, not us. No, no, that's we, we, we've got to be careful of that. The other part, with regard to doing it, town meeting has that nice big clock up front and the speaker gets to know exactly how much he or she has and you'll see a lot of people, they're going strong and all of a sudden they, they wind it up. I would agree with what Ms. Morgan said. Uh, majority of them, could stay within that time. Mm -hmm. And if they need more, I think the chair, it should be discretionary to the chair. But by putting it in there, I, I would not be asking us for a vote. I don't want to get tied up into the minutia of, uh, like Congress is going right now, asking right. for different votes right. and stuff. It's crazy. All right, so I think you have the necessary feedback on that. Are there any other policies that people want to comment on? Are you directing us to suspend like Jerry Nadler's doing? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> The gentle lady shall suspend. All right. A uh, motion to strike the last word. <laughs> uh, so we need, a, we need a motion to approve policy BEA. A move. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Uh, yes. yes. Any opposed or abstentions? All right. Subcommittee and liaison reports. Budget. Budget will be meeting. Policies and procedures, we, anything further? Uh, the minutes from that last meeting are in the in Novus, so that uh, yep. anyone who wants to go and look at what, how we discuss this and, and what happened to some of the other things that were brewing, uh, it, it's all sitting there. Great. CIAA. Nothing to report, but I understand that we have some thing that we need, are going to be charged with. Yes, so just today I, uh, emailed Jane requesting that the CIAA committee take on working with the administration on report, on working on a schedule and process and the draft of the new plan that we have to submit under the Student Opportunity Act, which is due April 1st. So in the in Novus is the part of the lo new law that describes the plan. It's mm -hmm. relatively vague, but mm -hmm. um, uh, there's a requirement 
There's going to be a requirement to have a CPAC about it. There's a requirement to, this. we don't have an ELL CPAC, right? <coughs> we don't have an ELL Parent Advisory Committee. So. Yeah, not yet. Um, so it's not quite clear exactly what, how much further guidance mm. the state is going to give on it for the first round of the plan, but um, uh, CIA seemed like the right place for that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, facilities. Oh, community relations. Sorry. Uh, we need something in January, but uh, to talk about the Rainbow Coalition appointment, uh, continue talking about after school and um, calendar issues. So we'll try to schedule that in January. Okay. Uh, just uh, a point on that. Uh, Dr. Seuss put out a request for opinions from other districts in the MASC email list. And I recommend you take a look at the calendar from Newton because I just thought the design of that was really nice. Oh, I, I agree, actually. I, yeah. love, I like the Newton County that was where, that, Yeah, that's that, one of my favorites. That, that yeah. was nice. That <laughs> yeah, was yeah. Nice. I have a short stack of the ones I like in Newton's yeah. number one. Yeah. All right. Uh, facilities, Mr. Hayner. I uh, met with the Bracket PTO this past week uh, discussing what has been done and what is, uh, what is going on and what will be done with regard to facilities. I've met with uh, the Hardy and the Pierce PTOs as well. Uh, I would like to commend uh, Jim Feeney, the Facilities Director, and Michael Mason for their help in preparing these presentations and their responses back to any of the questions that the parents have asked. Uh, it's been received very positively. Uh, the next meeting will be in January, on January 28th at the Dallin PTO at 7 p.m. Okay. Thank you. Can, can yes. I? Talk about so the I'm the other silent member of the Facilities Committee, and I haven't been able to attend because... Um, and I just want to, but I am on all the emails, and I just want to say that what Bill has come up with is working really nicely. Awesome. It great. is doing everything he was hoping for and more. I think it's really giving the parents a sense that things are actually happening in the schools and that there is concern about the building and, and things like that. And I just, Can he deserves the kudos for them. Can we see him? Well, it's just, you know, it's kind of the, it, it's not... Oh, it's you know, it, it's not complimentary things. It's kind of just the way that it's it's the way things are put. It, okay. it, 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 I, they've been very receptive uh, initially. They, they, they come off they're surprised there, but once we had the discussion and finding out who's connected to whom, uh, it, it just hit me. I thought the bracket school was brand new. It's now 20 years old. Yeah, <laughs> and, and I'm just getting old. I don't want to accept it. But uh, it's the, the email who, threads who to, who to communicate with and, and yeah. who to talk with. Yeah. Uh, okay. Great. My job is just PR. I make no decisions and I promise nothing. Right, Mike? <laughs> I remember standing up there watching them demolish the old school. Uh, yeah. Legal services, nothing. Building committee we covered. Uh, calendar committee, anything you want to? Uh, we had a meeting last night uh, with the community. There's going to be a meeting um, on the 18th, and I mentioned this before. I, I'd like to put on the agenda for next time to get this committee's um, thoughts, just to hear our thoughts. We won't, I don't expect mm -hmm. any, any recommendation or anything at that point. Well, I mean, the calendar committee is an advisory committee to the administration. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So my thought would be we would wait for a recommendation from the administration, but. Okay. Well, uh, I, I w I'm just sort of curious. I haven't actually heard from everyone, and so I think mm -hmm. part of the information gathering, it might be helpful to hear mm -hmm. um, this committee's thoughts. Yeah. But, yes. but it's at your I, I agree that I mean I, I don't I think that we should talk it out a little here so that the, you know not only does this advisory committee present data. Uh, having a sense of what the domain is is that it, where, where the recommendation will be going is important. So I would certainly be happy to give my opinion on the calendar process uh, for a minute or two within the context of a properly posted meeting. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think yeah. it's the framing of the issue that's still missing to me. I mean, so the, the, the meeting yesterday was about only about religious holidays. Mm -hmm. There was right. nothing about this issue with going too late in June. Right. So right. are you looking for input only on religious holidays and what holidays we should add or subtract? So the, this year, the only discussion on the table are the religious holidays and then the look of the calendar. This year, nothing is being discussed about before Labor Day. Or, yeah. 
Yes, Mr. Tainer. I would just counsel that if any of us send it to you, you don't respond. So another she's way. She's looking to have I mean, a discussion. She's looking to have a discussion. Yeah, another way we could do this is that we could ask school committee members to send in, um, something to the calendar committee. It's all going to be looked at. We have a bunch of letters to go through. That could be another way to get right, feedback. Well, uh, okay. I don't know. <coughs> I think we should talk. We have to have a conversation here. So. Yeah. Yeah. Also, <coughs> the committee got, we got elected. We have to talk about it. Um, if it's an, I, I think, I think putting, having a discussion now during subcommittee reports without posting it on the agenda is right. not mm -hmm. good. No, no, no. Good yeah. points. Yeah, just so, yeah. Whether to have an agenda item. I think you on, have an agenda item, yeah. calendar, school committee discussion on, on religious holidays. You yep. just put it, it right up. It's just a preliminary. So, you know, it's still, we're still mm -hmm. gathering information. Yeah. yeah. That'll take all night. Um, well, since you're the decision makers on this, mm -hmm. um, I wonder about the timing of it. I totally mm -hmm. think you have to have a, a discussion of it. The question is whether it's now or a little bit later. Or so the later would be after we. After the after the recommendation. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, I think it should yeah. be. Okay. Yeah. Uh, no, I, 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 I well, I mean, I'm on the fence of it. I have a. <clears throat> I feel like we should let the committee do its job. Personally, I'm interested yep. in the committee finishing its work and then talking. But I'm. I wasn't there last time. My wife was, so mm -hmm. I got insights. So got, to, got some insights, but I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know what. To, I don't know how to. But that's that's my own opinion. But the, okay. the majority of the committee right. want to talk about well, waiting for the calendar committee. Then that's what no. we do. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. I want to go home. I, I would feel more comfortable in the calendar committee knowing the opinions of the people who might vote on it, because I wouldn't want to bring forth a proposal thinking that life is good where you're <laughs> not, not going to get to four votes. Yeah, I mean, I, I, we'll talk about it. What, what, what Why don't you guys think about, talk about it? I mean, you've gathered, you've gathered a lot of information. You must have some yeah. stuff you can present. Yep. So yeah, we'll, a lot of we'll, email. We'll talk about that. Yeah. It just needs to be a posted item on the agenda. School yeah, committee discussion. Absolutely. I think the chair frames it by saying, we're not going to take a vote tonight, or if somebody makes a motion and it passes, it passes. <laughs> I mean, I don't know. No, that won't no. be the argument. <laughs> I don't think your motion yeah, not, yet. Pass, not, yet. But, uh, not yet. Or, no, I don't know what the motion would be. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think in that context the motion would pass. I wouldn't. No. Let's it, wait it will, for it. Will, it, will not be, it will not be an item that will allow a vote on a calendar change. So I think you need to be specific about that as agenda. All right. Uh, election board. Modernization Committee, is there anything? Uh, we're meeting next week um, just to, there's going to be a warrant article to extend this committee. There's a feeling that we can't get everything done in a year, so okay. there you go. Superintendent search process. Uh, we had to postpone the meeting of the 4th uh, because Mr. Kucher was unavailable. We'll be meeting in this room at 5 o'clock next Thursday. What's the date? Do you know? Uh, take today's date and add 7. Thank you. Uh, nothing on negotiation. <coughs> Liaison reports. I have to I have to Anything? Time. Announcements? Mr. Hainer. I wish to commend the staff and the students, the Arlington High School Interact Do Something Club under the supervision of Alicia Majid work to collect necessities such as bathroom supplies, socks and gloves, all of, which, all of which were packaged together into 80 personal care packages. On the Wednesday before Thanksgiving, Mike Sandler, a teacher, and several of the students who had worked on the packages went to the Salvation Army in Cambridge to serve a warm meal. The students also distributed all the care packages. Thank you. Any other announcements? Yeah, yeah we had, uh, right after the policies and procedures meeting uh, last couple weeks ago now, uh, we all wandered off to the um, AEF fundraiser, uh, which presented a whole bunch of really great projects that, that, uh, that our teachers were behind. Uh, a lot of great things happening for very small money, and, and so that if people are looking to make a donation that gets a lot of mileage, uh, AEF is a, is a good place. Great, thank you. Any other future agenda items other than we've discussed? Yes, Mrs. Um, I'd love to see an agenda, agenda item on inclusion practices that we're doing. Sort of like, I, I know things are different this year, there's a lot of new initiatives that inclusive, but we've got sort of these co-taught classrooms. Okay. Yeah, so I'd love to, I'd just I'd love to hear more about it. All right, and do we have an executive session? No. All right, motion to adjourn. So move. Mm -hmm.
Second. Second. So <laughs> second. All those in favor? Aye. Yes. Aye. Any opposed or abstentions? Great. We are adjourned. Right on schedule.